Ladies and gentlemen, what is happening? So just before you freak out by how long this video is, let me give you some context real quickly. So this actually used to be an online course that I was charging $497 for, but I don't really want to associate myself with the whole information business, so I decided to post the entire thing on YouTube for free. So if you are someone who's looking for a change or possibly a career change, then this is the video for you because if you watch until the end of this video, you'll know exactly how you can quit your job, get a job on a super yacht, travel the world and make amazing money whilst doing it. So let's get into it. What's up guys, so my name is Carl Farrow and I actually worked on the super yacht industry for two years and on two different yachts and it was without a doubt one of the greatest decisions I've ever made in my entire life. It allowed me to travel to some of the most amazing places in the world, meet and make new friends from every corner of the globe and it allowed me to make amazing money whilst at it and it really set me up for where I am now because working in the super yacht industry gave me the maturity and also the finances for me to come home back to South Africa and start my very own business. And that would not have been possible if it wasn't for the super yacht industry. So the super yacht industry is something that's very, very close to my heart. And the reason why I wanted to post this whole thing online for free is because if it could have such a big impact and change in my life, and if I could put that information out and help people, then I think that the internet should have this online course. So ladies and gentlemen, how this video, so ladies and gentlemen, how this video is set up is if you look in the description or the highlighted comment, you'll actually see timestamps for every module in the video. So if you want to fast forward or go ahead or there's a couple of questions you need answered, use the timestamps as a guideline to find each video in the course. And also, if you have any question throughout this online course, please leave it in the comment section. I'm jumping on it. I'll answer all the questions. And ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, enjoy the online course. Cheers. Around the world, more and more people are packing their bags and leaving for a life out at sea. Let's face it, who wouldn't jump at the opportunity of traveling the world on a super yacht? Great money that is tax free, no living expenses and opportunities to do and experience things that few people can. So what is the super yacht industry? Well, people often get it confused. Usually when you tell people that you work on a super yacht, the immediate response is usually, oh. So you're working on like a cruise ship? And this ladies and gentlemen is wrong. The super yacht industry has nothing to do with the cruise ship industry. This is a super yacht and this is a cruise ship. Now we get it that right now that may look the same to you. So let's explain the actual difference. A super yacht is an extremely luxurious sailing or motor powered vessel usually larger than 24 meters and is privately owned by a wealthy, high net worth individual. The super yacht will either be used by the owner with his family and friends, which would make it a private yacht, or the owner rents the super yacht out to extremely rich individuals or celebrities who are able to afford it, and this would make it a charter yacht. For example, super yachts are usually chartered during big and glamorous events like the Monaco Grand Prix or the Cannes Film Festival. Now, cruise ships on the other hand, they are very different. Cruise ships are commercial and they are open to the public, a lot cheaper to make use of and are usually within a fleet of six or several other ships owned by a major corporation such as Viking Ocean Cruises or Royal Caribbean International for example. So now that you have a better understanding of what the super yacht industry actually is, let's now talk about the super yacht industry at large. So you have a much better idea going forward. The super yacht industry is an incredibly unique industry and truly unlike any other. There are more than 5,000 super yachts in the world today and approximately 150 are built every year. The super yacht industry has more than doubled in the last 10 years with the industry directly employing 148,000 to 163,000 people worldwide. There are now over 10,000 super yachts in existence and according to sales data this number is set to continue rising. Over 370 super yachts alone were sold in 2017, totaling an amazing 3,285 million euros. More super yachts will mean more job opportunities for crew at every level. So whether you're just starting out or you already have some experience under your belt, the demand for skilled yacht crew is set to rise in direct correlation with yacht sales. 
now that you have a better understanding of the Cipion industry and what it's all about, let's move on to the benefits of starting a job in the Cipion industry and what exactly you can expect. See you in the next video. In the last video, we spoke about the 10 benefits of traveling the world on a super yacht. Now, one of the biggest reasons we started this online course was to provide you with valuable, insightful and actionable information on how to start a career on yachts. However, it is also important for us to not paint this dream that yachting is the perfect job and you'll live a perfect life. So it is a great job and a wonderful life, however, it comes at a big sacrifice. So. In this video, we're going to talk about those sacrifices. This is the seven questions you need to ask yourself before joining the super yacht industry. Question number one, can you be away from home, friends and family for extended periods of time? Poking out with the boys, dinner and drinks with the girls, watching your little brother play rugby, weddings and family gatherings, be prepared to miss it all. With great reward comes great sacrifice and homesickness can really set in at times. However, it's not all doom and gloom. There are always a scarp away and remember your crew feel exactly the same way you do. They will become your new family so you are not completely alone. Question number two. Can you live and work in a tiny confined workspace with multiple people? Did we mention that two people will be living in a tiny cabin the size of a double bed? No kidding. Depending on the size and type of your yacht, space will vary. However, ample space is non-existent on a super yacht. It's not easy living in confined spaces with a lot of people, so practicing cleanliness and respecting your crew space will really go a long way. Question number three. Can you survive on little sleep? The super yacht industry is all about work hard, play hard. With a little free time during the season, your few days off and time off will involve parting it up until the early hours of the morning and getting up for work a few hours later. Sleepings and catching up on sleep will be a thing of the past. Save that for the winter. Question number four. Can you keep high spirits while doing repetitive and unattractive jobs? Can you get used to not using your brain much? Repetitive, mundane and boring tasks? You'll have to get used to it. For the deckhands, you have the pleasure of being out in the sun and doing physical works. However, for the stews, you confined to indoors and below deck, seeing very, very, very little sun from where you are. Also, the super industry is extremely, extremely tough work. It's labor intensive, and during the season, it's not un uncommon to work 12 to 14 hour days while guests are on board. Are you willing to put in this type of work? Question number five. Are you thick skinned? Picture this, it's been a month long boss trip, you haven't had a day off in ages, you're tired, emotional and feel overworked. Emotions are running wild and people are moody. People are snapping at one another and there's a ton of drama. You get insulted, it's not easy. You need to not take things personally and you need to be strong and thick skinned. Are you adding to the drama or are you keeping peace? You have to stay upbeat, stay positive. Deal with everyone's emotions and remember, everyone is just as tired and emotional as you are. Not all the time, but guests can tend to be very rude and also extremely demanding. Take it in your stride and remind yourself why you are here. Question number six. Are you willing to fit your entire life into a suitcase? As mentioned previously, space is extremely, extremely limited. You really have to pack wisely. Rocking up to your new boat with three to four huge bags will not sit well with your captain or crew. Pack the essentials and remember, if you forget something, you can always get what you need once you're there. With that being said, it's also a, an incredible feeling. Fitting everything into a suitcase and traveling on a whim is an extremely liberating feeling. Enjoy the sense of freedom. It's a super special thing. And finally, question number seven. Are you able to accept that being in a relationship or long distance will be extremely tough? If it's one thing that we can all agree on is that long distance sucks. It's not easy and it's even more difficult when you work on a super yacht. Because free time during the season is so little, you might choose your tiny bit of free time to sleep or to go out and get some air. Depending on your boat, you'll most likely be traveling a lot during the season. This means having stable relationships, 
and or relationships are almost impossible. It's an incredible feeling to bump into a friend in some tiny port somewhere in Italy. However, most likely you'll go your separate ways the next day or two. If you have hopes of meeting and having a girlfriend or boyfriend in the industry, it's not going to be easy. It's possible to date somebody on your boat, but there's a saying in the industry that goes, don't screw the crew. So tread carefully, because there's no such thing as privacy on a super yacht and be prepared for everyone to be in your business. So there you have it. Those are the seven questions you need to ask yourself. If most of your answers were yes, congratulations. You could potentially have a long and exciting future in the super yacht industry. It's extremely important to fully understand something before jumping into it. And we hope this opening module made sense of what the industry is and if it's for you. Now, let's get to the exciting part, how to start a career in the super yacht industry. See you then. Welcome back guys, so now that you have a better understanding towards what the super yacht industry is, let's now talk about you. How do you fit into all of this? And to do this, we're going to be talking about the 10 benefits of traveling the world on a super yacht as a super yacht crew member. So let's jump right in. Number one, the travel. As yacht crew, you'll get to travel to some of the most famous and beautiful locations in the whole world and be berthed in the most exclusive ports and marinas. Depending on the super yacht you are employed on, your travel itinerary will differ. However, in the European summer, super yachts will usually be used to travel all over the Mediterranean from places like Cannes, Monaco, Greece and Croatia are all extremely popular. Then many boats, which are dual season, will cross over to the Caribbean to start the season there. The opportunities to travel on a super yacht are next to none and to add to the adventure you'll be rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous getting an interesting insight into their lifestyle whilst on board these super yachts number two the friendships the friendships that form at sea are often friendships for life super yacht crew are an extremely social and outgoing bunch so you'll have no problem making lots of new friends you will meet so many like-minded people in crew houses on your SCCW training and in super yacht hubs all over the world and it's such an incredible feeling knowing that you have friends from every corner of the globe. Number three, expense free living. Yacht crew earn a fantastic salary when you take into account you have zero living expenses. Life at sea is literally expense free. On a super yacht you have no accommodation or rent to pay, laundry is done for you, uniform is provided, you have zero food or drink bills to pay for, and better yet, even your toiletries are paid for. Number four, the tax-free money. Obviously, depending greatly on where you come from. However, most salary, most super yacht crew salary each month is wonderfully tax-free. Add to this the zero expense living, and this brings us to our next benefit. Number five, the money you can save. There's very few jobs in the world that have such a low barrier, in, barrier to entry and provide you with such a great salary for entry level employment. It's not unheard of to go a whole summer season without a day off. So during a busy season with little time off, it can be really difficult to spend your money. So if you save your money well and are fortunate to receive tips during the season, you could come home with a very sizable amount in one season. Number six, the medical benefits. The boat you are employed on will add you as part of their comprehensive crew medical aid so you'll not have to worry or not to have that as a worry. Also, you'll have the travel insurance while you're employed on the vessel so that is a huge plus. Number 7. Leave and Holidays Now, all crew members leave and rotation are different from boat to boat and also depend on your position and experience. However, regardless of your position, your leave rust on a super yacht is better than most corporate jobs. Let me explain. So most boats offer crew two months paid leave per year, while most larger yachts offer crew rotation, 
What is rotation? Well, rotation is great because you have time to plan your holiday as you know when it will be in advance. For example, rotation can be a four on one system, meaning you'll work for four months on and have one month off. You can be on a three on one system, which means you work for three months and then have one month off. So while you progress, your rotation will improve. So for example, many head chefs on larger yachts have two months on and two months off rotation. So that's quite incredible. So this moves us to our next point. Number eight, flights. Now, the only thing better than paid leave, the boat paying for your flights. Yep, you heard right. Many boats cover one to two flights a year to your home destination from wherever you are in the world. So this is an incredible perk. Number nine, the perks. In what other job would you get to experience such a different lifestyle from having access to equipment and luxury facilities for your own use when there are no guests on board, to water sports days filled with jet skis and snorkeling, to Michelin star chefs cooking for you, the perks in yachting are truly unlike any other industry in the world. And finally, number 10, the unforgettable experiences. And of course, the once in a lifetime memories. From the sunset at, sunsets at anchor, the trunk and crazy nights with crew, and the day trips to the most amazing locations, these are the moments that you will cherish and will become stories you'll share for many, many years to come. Now, as amazing as that all sounds, for every positive, there's always negatives. And like anything with life, with great reward comes great sacrifice. So in the next video, we're going to be talking about the seven sacrifices you'll have to make if you choose a life on a super yacht. So we'll see you in the next video. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to module two. So to kick things off, let's start by answering the question, how do you actually get a job on a super yacht? Well, the answer to that can be split into two parts. So first, we're gonna be talking about the three ways to land a job, and thereafter, we will discuss the six step process to get started. So, first things first, you will land a job on a super yacht through one of three ways. The first way could be through a friend. Now. You know the saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know? This couldn't be more true, especially in the super industry. People often know somebody who works in the industry and are often the reason people get a job. When a position opens up on their super yacht, the friend will often put in the good word to the captain and help you work with them. You could also meet somebody on your training, in a crew house, or out and about on a night out. Networking is so, so, so important and knowing and meeting the right people can definitely help you progress quicker in the Supion industry. However, for most of us who don't know people in the industry, your first job can come from two different avenues. The second way is through day work. Day work is the process of temporarily working on a super yacht and helping out crew with numerous tasks. Often before the season starts, super yacht crew will need to get the boat clean and ready for guests to come on board. Captains and officers will often look for extra help in the form of day work crew to assist them. This is a great way to build experience for a CV and make some money while you're on the job hunt. And often, the day work leads to permanent positions on board. But don't worry, we will talk about day work in greater detail in later sections. The third way is through a crew agency. Now, what is a crew agency, you may ask? Well, crew agents are placed throughout the world to assist crew in finding employment. Crew members join the agency through submitting their necessary paperwork online and they then assist you in finding a job on board. Yachts will pay crew agents a fee to provide them with suitable crew members for positions on board. It's not unheard of for crew agents to find new crew members a job without any prior experience. However, for the majority of new crew, it doesn't tend to happen often. However, not to worry though, in later sections we'll discuss these three topics in greater detail. 
And so now that you know the three ways to get a job on a super yacht, let's move on to the six steps you first need to follow. So starting with step number one, you'll have to choose an entry level position. Then step number two, you need to get the minimum qualification to work on a super yacht. Then step number three, you need to obtain the correct visa and paperwork. Then step number four, you'll need to create your super yacht CV. Then step number five, you will need to choose a super yacht hub to begin your job search. And then finally, step number six, you will network, dock walk, do day work and build your experience until you land your first job. Now, we know that right now this may all sound a little overwhelming, but not to worry. Throughout the next few videos and modules, we're going to greater detail on all these steps. So, we'll see you in the next video. Welcome back everybody and in this lesson we are going to be talking about the different entry level positions on board a super yacht. So there are four departments on board a super yacht. You have the deck department, the galley department, the engineering department and the interior department. All of these departments have different entry level positions that you have to start in order to work your way up. So let's start off with a deck department. The entry level position here is to be a deckhand. Now, deckhand is usually the position taken up by guys, and as a deckhand, it is your job to maintain the cleanliness and perform duties regarding the exterior of the yacht. Your duties and responsibilities will vary depending on the size of the yacht and how many deck crew are employed on the vessel. On larger yachts, deckhands will usually perform mainly cleaning duties. These duties will include washing the boat, cleaning the windows, polishing the stainless steel and scrubbing the decks. This is usually the case on yachts larger than 70 meters. However, different size yachts come with different roles, responsibilities and lifestyles. As yachts decrease in size, so do the number of deck crew, resulting in increased responsibilities for the deckhands. Deckhands on smaller yachts will be more involved with activities such as tender driving, sports days with guests, anchoring, mooring procedures, varnishing and painting. Deckhand is a very very fun position because you're outside, you're in the sun and you're getting a lot of physical work done. A deckhand is a great position to start and we here at Super Yacht School, that's where we got our starting point that was as a deckhand. Now let's talk about the interior department. And the entry level position for the interior department is to be a stewardess. A stewardess is responsible for the interior maintenance of the vessel. Their job is to deliver the highest standard of service to the guests on board. The job has many different aspects which will vary depending on your position, experience and also in terms of the size of the boat in which you are employed. Larger yachts tend to assign more specific roles to stewardesses depending on their experience. For example, a junior stew may be on laundry duties, a third or second stew may be on housekeeping, whilst the chief stew focuses on service. Rotation usually happens amongst the stews so they can remain energized and gain experience. On smaller yachts, stews will find themselves involved in every aspect of the interior and may, have, may even have to perform some duties in other departments such as the galley or the deck. Now let's move on to the galley department. The entry level position would be a sous chef or a crew chef. Now, Head chefs on board super yachts are extremely well trained. They usually have 5 star hotel or high end restaurant background experience and most importantly have a passion for food. Aspiring yacht chefs without this level of experience may join the industry as a sous or crew chef. Alternatively, they will join a smaller more relaxed vessel in order to adapt to the demands of the industry. One of the biggest adjustments for chefs moving into the yachting industry is the planning and provisioning aspect. Chefs must plan for guest trips and charters that sometimes last as long as a month. The limited provisioning and produce available in certain areas presents a challenge. A super yacht chef has many benefits to their land-based counterpart. A chef on board has great freedom. They're not limited to specific menus and are encouraged to be creative with meal plans. Cooking for various nationalities, 
cultures and culinary preferences can therefore be highly enjoyable and provides invaluable career experience. Additionally, budgets are usually large or non-existent on Superyacht. Superyacht owners want memorable culinary experiences and usually grant their chefs sufficient funds to achieve this. This now brings us to the last department and this is the engineering department. An entry level position in the engineering department will either be deckhand engineer or second third engineer depending on the experience and size of the vessel. Superior engineers are often regarded as the unsung heroes who work tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the smooth operation of the vessel and all onboard machinery and systems. As technology on yachts has evolved, so has the roles of the engineers. The modern day engineer needs to have an extensive and multifaceted skill set. The role of the engineering department extends much further than the running and maintenance of the main engines. They, they assume the responsibility for almost all machinery on board. It is the engineer's job to ensure that all mechanical and electrical systems function correctly and are safe to operate. Along with the captain, the primary responsibility of a chief engineer is to ensure the safety of all personnel on board. A chief engineer will have a planned maintenance schedule that they follow. They also play a big role in the planning and execution of a yard period of refit. So, there you have it. Now that you have a better understanding of the four departments on board a super yacht and the associated entry level positions, it's time to speak about these in more detail. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. Welcome back everybody. So now that you understand the entry level positions on board a super yacht, let's discuss the hierarchy on board a super yacht. We'll also explain the roles and purposes of different positions on board and how all the different departments coexist with one another. We also touch on the different super yacht salaries that crew members earn. So let's start off right at the top. And at the top of any super yacht hierarchy is the captain, also known as the skipper. Arguably the most well-known respected job role aboard any yacht, large or small, the captain has one primary duty on board, the safe manning and operation of the vessel and the care of his guests and crew. The main responsibilities of a superyacht captain include the safe navigation and operation of the yacht, budget management and accounting, decision making and crew management, managing the upkeep of the yacht, Taking, care, taking control of yacht repairs and refit projects, assuming the role of host and entertaining when necessary. The captain is running the show and captain is God. What captain says usually goes and this then brings us to the second person in charge. This person is the first officer, also known as the chief mate. Now, all super yachts generally have a first officer or a chief mate who is essentially ready to take over the yacht should anything happen to the captain. On larger yachts, there may also be a second officer. Job roles therefore vary depending on the setup of the department. The first officer is second in command to the captain and manages all the deck crew including the second officer, the third officer, the bosuns and the deckhands. He or she is responsible for ensuring the safety of the yacht and individuals on board, overseeing all deck operations and management, supervision and preparation of water toys, the management of administrative and safety procedures on board, bridge watches and the navigational passage planning of the yacht. This then will bring us to the second officer. The second officer acts as understudy to the first officer. He or she may be specifically responsible for the navigation of the yacht and keeping charts and publications up to date. Other duties include monitoring the navigation and radio equipment and undertaking bridge watches when out at sea. The second officer may also be designated security, safety or medical officer. This then brings us on to the bosun. Now, the bosun, sometimes known as the leading hand or the senior deckhand, is likely to be an experienced deckhand working his or her way up the career ladder. The bosun is responsible for maintaining the exterior of the yacht and is in charge of supervising all the deckhands. The bosun is responsible for organizing deck operations, including storage, the use of maintenance of tenders, toys and equipment, deck maintenance and supplies. He's usually in charge of driving guests on the tender to and from destinations. 
He is also assist in bridge watches and overseeing security. He is also in charge of overseeing the passerelle and the safety of guests as they embark and disembark. And is also in charge of outstanding guest service and usually has a brilliant and keen eye for detail. This then brings us on to the deckhand and the deckhand is at the bottom of the hierarchy. As explained in previous videos, a deckhand is just one of the entry level positions available on board a super yacht. Primarily, he or she will work with other deckhands to maintain the exterior of the yacht, keeping it in pristine condition. This then moves us on to the engineering department. So, at the top of the engineering department hierarchy, you have the first engineer or the chief engineer. Now, the chief engineer is in charge of the engineering department on board and is responsible for its safe and efficient operation. Reporting directly to the captain, he or she will manage the vessel's engineers, electrical technical officers and electricians. Some of the responsibilities of a chief engineer include the day-to-day -day management of mechanical and electrical operations on board, team management and supervision, the coordination of operations with shore side engineers, troubleshooting and repair of all systems and equipment on board, the sourcing and purchasing of parts, the docking, undocking and anchoring of the yacht. So this would then bring us on to the second or third engineer. Working under the chief engineer, the second or third engineers will be expected to have a wide knowledge and will work across all and most aspects of engineering on board, depending on the other engineering staff. This would then bring us to the ETO. The ele electrician or technical officer, now according to the chart, it looks like he's at the bottom of the, of the hierarchy, however it's not to get that confused. Um, the ETO would normally fit in somewhere below the chief engineer and the second engineer. So the ETO is responsible for the day-to-day -day maintenance of all electronic, computer, audio-visual and communications equipment, ensuring its efficient operation. On a large superyacht, these systems are likely to be numerous and complex. This then brings us on to the purser. A purser is a senior crew member who manages several areas of the superyacht, ranging from crew recruitment and financial matters to interior management and provisioning, depending on the crew on board. Purses are typically found on much larger yachts, as the role can otherwise contain a large amount of crossover with the responsibilities of the chief stewardess or housekeeper. Where required, the purser becomes the chief of finances and keeping the accounts and financial affairs of the yacht in order. Some of the responsibilities of the purser include the management of all financial matters on board, including accounting and bookkeeping, HR, payroll and general crew management, such as keeping crew certifications up to date, management of the yacht's interior, including inventory tasks, provisioning the vessel with food, beverages, cleaning supplies, uniforms, etc., working with the heads of departments to ensure smooth, efficient management of financial matters and purchasing and provisioning of logistics. She is also in charge of planning events and arranging owner and guest trips, as well as managing pre-arrival tasks such as transport options and venue checks. This would then move us on to the chief steward or stewardess. Now, a chief steward or stewardess is likely to have progressed to this role through learnt experience on board a super yacht. They are in charge of the operation of the yacht's interior and its staff, reporting directly to the captain. Attention to detail and outstanding yet discreet guest service are vital to this role. It is absolutely paramount. The main responsibilities of a chief stewardess include food and service, including silver service, drink service and bartending, the oversight of accommodation, cleaning and preparation, cabin preparation, flower arranging, obtaining local currency, arranging trips, transports and events for the owners and guests. Underneath the, the, the chief stewardess, you'll have the head of housekeeping, second stew and finally the junior or third stewardess. A yacht steward or stewardess wears many hats aboard a super yacht. From junior to senior roles and different interior departments, stewardesses are co collectively responsible for the everyday running and smooth operation of the yacht's interior and guest hospitality. The stewardess is at the bottom of the food chain, much like the deckhand. This then finally brings us to the galley department, and in charge of this department would be the head chef. Depending on the size of the yacht, a chef may work alone or may manage a sous chef or a crew cook or galley hand, while at all times keeping galley in pristine condition. He or she must be able to prepare a wide range of dishes from the basic to the exotic, sometimes of scarce supplies. Some of the responsibilities of the head chef include devising interesting and delicious menus, 
meeting the demands of dire requirements for owners and crew, sourcing and purchasing food items and ingredients, arranging the transportation of food to the yacht, the preparation, cooking and presentation of meals for guests, and cleaning and maintaining the galley. So, now that you understand the hierarchy on board the super yacht, this then leaves us with the next question. How much do super yacht crew earn? Well, attached below, we have left a complete list of different positions on board and how much they earn relative to the size of the super yacht. So, to view this page, just click on the link below the video and you'll see all of the information there. So, this then wraps up this video. Thanks for watching guys and we will see you in the next video. What's happening guys and welcome back. So if you're serious about getting your first job on a super yacht, it really is best to pick up and move to one of the main yachting hubs and hiring ports of the world to get started on your job search. Although leaving friends and family behind may be difficult, your job search will be predicated on moving to a super yacht hub. Now, there are a few destinations around the world that are known in the industry as yachting hubs due to the sheer number of yachts that pass through them each year. A few of these are therefore also known to be prolific hiring ports as they are the common connecting points between cruisers and are often the place where crew leave the boats and are swiftly replaced. It's important to choose the right hiring port early on in your job search. Your travel budget, visa requirements and more importantly the time of year will all influence your choice of port. The idea is to arrive at a super yacht hub, hit the ground running by meeting crew agents and putting yourself out there so you'll be ready for an interview when the opportunity presents itself. So what are the super yachting hubs? Well the three main yachting hubs and hiring ports for super yacht crew hopefuls are considered to be number one Antibes in the south of France or Antibes, Palma de Mallorca in Spain and Fort Lauderdale in America. So let's quickly touch on each destination. Number one, Antibes. Antibes is a resort town between Cannes and Nice on the French Riviera. This town overlooks luxury yachts moored at Port Vauban Marina and is home to some of the most famous super yachts in the world. As the largest yachting hub in the Mediterranean, Antibes is a rustic old town with a busy summer touristic season. The town is full of crew hopefuls and every year thousands flock down in hope of finding their first job. It is also full of existing crew members looking to unwind and relax before starting the season all over again. Number 2. Palma de Mallorca of Spain Palma is the capital city of the Spanish Mediterranean island and home to more than half of Mallorca's population. Palma is appealing all year round with an explosion of new trendy restaurants, fashionable bars, popular nightclubs and not to mention its dynamic yachting industry. Palma is well known for being an extremely popular port for large sailing yachts. If you have a preference of landing a job on a sailing yacht, you should definitely start your job hunt in this beautiful city. Then number three, we have Fort Lauderdale. Now, Fort Lauderdale is a city on Florida's southeastern coast, known for its beaches, burning canals, and its infamous yachting industry. Miami is a common host for extravagant yachts at all times of the year, with the Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show running at the end of October, a huge yachting spectacle in the Northern Hemisphere. Super yacht jobs can of course also be found in other locations around the world, but these three in particular offer far greater access to quality job opportunities and are considered more accessible for beginner crew just starting out in the industry. So now that you know the super yachting hubs, the question remains, when is the best time to look for work? Well, it's important to note that super yachts work in seasons and the best time to find employment is before and after busy seasons as crew members will change jobs during this time and many other positions will become available. Jobs can of course come up any time and in any part of the world, but common sense suggests you need to be where the majority of the super yachts are. This means moving with the yachting seasons to be in the hiring ports we listed above. 
So let's talk about the yachting seasons, starting with summer, which runs from May to September. So the summer yachting season kicks off in Europe in the Mediterranean in May, with yachts usually all crewed up and ready to go by the end of May. It then closes with the Yacht Monaco show in late September, with yachts clearing out in the following weeks. The best times to job hunt in the Mediterranean is therefore in April, with some opportunities in the south of France appearing in March. It's also important to remember that crew can go through changes during the season, so even though we say that the yachts tend to be fully crewed by the end of May, crew changes do happen and they do happen quite a bit during the season. So, the Mediterranean summer runs through to September and October. Then between September and October you have the summer winter transition. Yachts in the Med will either head to shipyards in Europe for maintenance work for the winter or will head across to the Atlantic Ocean to the southern states of America, typically Florida. Yachts will usually hire crew for the European winter which starts stocking up on crew for a crossing to the Caribbean. Then you have winter which runs from October through to April. The winter season usually starts on the US East Coast in Florida with the Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show in October, November. Fort Lauderdale and Miami are great places for beginner crew to start out and are unique in the large amounts of yachts passing through there not once but twice a year. Yachts usually congregate here all year round to enjoy the good weather but in the winter season if work is not found by December it's often recommended to move out to Caribbean to find work. So, to summarize quickly, the best time to find employment is before and after busy seasons. If you are going to the Mediterranean, the best time to start looking for work would be from April in Antibes or Palma. If you are going to Fort Lauderdale, the best time would be from October to November. Now, please note that this is merely a guideline as to when is the best time. As you will come to realize, nothing is ever set in stone in the super industry and our recommendations are based on our experiences and our findings. So now that you know where the super yacht hubs are, when their respective seasons start and the best time to look for work, let's talk about how long does it actually take to find work once you arrive at one of these super yacht hubs. That we will be covering in the next video, so we'll see you then. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. In this video we're going to be talking about something very important and that is the cost of starting a career in the super yacht industry. So let's start by setting one thing straight and that the super yacht industry is not cheap to get into. However it's also a very broad question which will differ greatly from one individual to another but after this video you will have a general idea of the savings required and the costs involved when joining. The good news is that once you get a job, you'll be able to quickly re recoup the costs. Yacht salaries are usually over 2,500 euros to 3,000 a month. Few industries exist where you have such a short barrier of entry and you're able to walk into such a well-paying job fairly quickly. Also to point out, you have zero living expenses whilst living on board. So when we talk about the total cost, it's very difficult to give an accurate estimate as there are so many variables depending on where you live, your desired entry level position and how much training you intend on doing. So if we look at everything as one big picture, all your expenses can be broken up as follows. Number one, the training costs. Number two, flight costs. Number three, visa costs. And number four, accommodation costs. And number five, day to day expenses. So firstly, let's discuss the training costs. The training costs can be split into two. You have the compulsory courses you have to do to work on a super yacht. Then you have additional courses that will help you differentiate yourself from the rest. So your compulsory training course is the STCW. Now the STCW is a basic safety training course and is compulsory for all crew members and seafarers across all maritime industries. Without it, you simply cannot work on a yacht. 
costs vary greatly in different countries. So we are going to put the average cost at $600. This we will go through in more detail at later sections. In addition to your SCCW, you would also have to do your ENG1 medical. An ENG1 medical certificate declares you are fit and healthy to safely engage in the duties associated with being a super yacht crew member. The ENG1 medical examination ensures that the crew member does not have any medical conditions that may jeopardize the safety of other crew members or passengers whilst on board. The cost of an ENG1 medical examination is quite standardized around the world and will cost you approximately 100 Euro, euros in Europe, $110 in the USA. So to take an estimated average, we will say the cost of this is 100 euros. This then moves us to additional courses. Now, additional courses are made available to crew who are looking to set themselves apart from the rest and see a long and successful career for themselves. There are many other courses available to crew joining the industry. These courses all vary in cost and it is up to the individual to prioritize which they need and decide which they can and can't afford. Also, we go through this in larger detail in later sections. However, let's assume you do one additional course at $500. So, the complete cost of your training, you are so far looking at $1,200. Now please note that this number can vary more or less depending where you are in the world. So now that the training is done, let's go on to flights. You will also need to take into consideration the cost of the flight to your chosen yachting hub where you will locate yourself whilst looking for work. Many countries, depending on your nationality, may require a return flight to show that you will be departing the country by a certain date. So it is strongly advisable to buy a flexi ticket in this case to avoid losing your flight altogether. You also have to take into account that if there are no training centers in your city, you'll have to fly to another city to do your compulsory training courses. So this is quite a difficult factor to estimate for. However, let's put the price at $600. This then brings us on to visas. Now, again, depending on your nationality and your destination, you may require visas to enter certain countries. These visas will vary greatly in price depending on location, nationality and length. A B1, B2 visa is needed for the US and will cost about 250 US dollars and a Schengen visa for Europe will cost approximately 100 to 150 euros. So we'll put the price for that at 200 dollars. Now this then brings us to the cost of accommodation. When you fly to a super yachting hub, you have the option of staying in crew houses with other crew looking for work or in shared apartments. The price of this will vary greatly depending on where you are located, however it is usually a significant cost. In Fort Lauderdale for example, crew accommodation is likely to cost anywhere between $160 to $280 a week, where in Antibes you will struggle to find anywhere less than €200 Euros a week. Palma del Morca prices vary greatly, but you are looking at about €100 Euros to €200 Euros a week. Now. It is very difficult to know how much money you'll need to put aside for accommodation expenses as there is no set amount of time to find a job. Some people find a job in five days, some people find a job in a week, some people find a job in a month, where some others could take up to four to six months. A good general rule is that you should have enough money available to comfortably cover one month's rent. This will give you enough of a cushion if you are struggling to find work as you, are, as you should be able to find some day work or temporary work in this time which will help bring in money and pay the rent. Two days of day work should at least cover a week's rent. But don't worry, we'll talk more about day work in later sections. So if we work out one month's rent, that'll bring us to $700. This then brings us to your day to day expenses. So now that we have worked out the cost of rent in a super yacht hub, let's talk about the daily expenses. Again, your daily expenses such as food, transport and drinking money will vary greatly from place to place. In Antibes you'll need about 15 to 25 euros a day, in Palma de Morca you're looking at 12 to 20 may be enough and in Fort Lauderdale about 20 to 30 dollars per day is usually required. It is likely you'll require transport if based in Fort Lauderdale as it is much larger and the marinas are very spread out. Avoid taxis at all costs as they are very expensive in super yachting hubs. Catching buses, riding bikes, 
renting a scooter and using Uber, although still quite expensive, are all still better alternatives. So on a $30 a day budget, it is safe to say that a month's day-to-day -day costs will set you back around $800. So when we tally up those five points and put them all together, this brings us to the final point. So what is the total cost of becoming a yachty? As we have said previously, it is very difficult to give an accurate estimate as there are so many variables and costs vary greatly across the world. However, we would advise you to have a minimum of $3,500 to pay for your compulsory courses, visas, accommodation and day-to-day -day expenses for the first month. It is good to have a safety net and it's good to always think of worst case scenario. But like we said, some people find work quicker than others. So this is a bare minimum and should give you enough time to find some day work. Without day work, you'll need a lot more money. So it's important to understand that this is just a guideline. So now that you understand the cost of starting a job in the super yacht industry, we hope this hasn't scared you. And like we said, you'll be able to pay this back within the first month. So that really is great. So now we're ready to move on to the next section. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next video. How long does it take to land a job on a super yacht? Well, this depends on the person. To find a job on a super yacht is extremely competitive, with crew members from all over the world flying to super yachting hubs to try and get hired on these amazing vessels. Regardless of whether they are in the interior or exterior or even in the engine room, competition is fierce. This means the best man or woman will always get the job. The bar of professionalism and training is constantly being raised and crew need to know that unless they give 100% they will not succeed in getting employment. Training, presentation, professionalism, a positive attitude and hard work will see you get on board. Anything less will not. On arrival at a super yacht hub, one really needs to hit the ground running and network as much as possible with other crew members and captains. Time is also extremely valuable. As the season approaches, many crew have to worry about finding work before their money or their visa runs out. So for individuals seeking a position as a deckhand, the average search time is within two to three months. However, don't let this discourage you as it is dependent on many, many factors. Do you sleep in every morning when you should be dock walking? Are you partying every night until the early hours of the morning? How dedicated are you to landing your first job? Your time depends on you. And as with anything in life, if you want it badly enough and put in the hard work, you can achieve anything. Deckhands on great boats with great jobs usually remain on their boats, which is possibly why deckhand jobs are a little bit less available than stewardess positions. However, there are deckhand jobs out there. When it comes to stewardess positions, these roles tend to become available more often. This is because there are more interior roles and positions and stewardesses tend to change positions and boats more often. Keep working hard, be persistent and eventually everyone finds their elusive first job.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back and welcome to module three. In this module, we're going to be discussing everything training related. And to kick things off, we're going to start by talking about the minimum training you need to get a job on a super yacht. So in order to gain employment on a super yacht, you must be STCW 10 certified. The need to have an STCW certification applies to every crew member, no matter their role, title or department. The STCW is the abbreviation for standards of training, certification and watchkeeping for seafarers. The STCW course needs to be refreshed every five years and is offered by training schools in various countries around the world. So what will you actually do in your STCW training? Well, the STCW 2010 consists of five basic training courses. The first one is your PSSR, which stands for Personal Safety and Social Responsibilities. This classroom-based course offers an introduction to accident prevention and safety procedures. It focuses on employment conditions, legal rights in the working environment, and a code of safe working practices. The next module you would go over is an exciting one, and that would be firefighting and fire prevention training course. Yep, you heard right, ladies and gentlemen, you will be firefighting. So in this very practical, exciting, and quite challenging module, you will learn to identify the different types of fires that can occur on board super yachts, analyze the measures in which to prevent them, this includes in-depth practical training in firefighting procedures and the correct and proper use of firefighting equipment and breathing apparatus. The next module you would do is elementary first aid. A combination of theory and practical training sessions for basic first aid. This focuses on the most likely emergencies on board. Training includes CPR, how to use a stretcher, how to move a patient, bandaging and splint methods along with familiarization and the most common medical equipment on board. Next up, you will do your PST, which stands for Personal Survival Techniques. This module focuses on sea survival training and how to deal with a variety of the more common emergencies on board. In-depth and practical training on how to launch a life raft, the uses of safety equipment, sea survival method methods, and the role of search and rescue organizations. And then finally, you'll be going over proficiency in security awareness. This module is a mandatory minimum requirement for the security training of any ship personnel. This course provides knowledge, understanding and proficiency to crew on ships that do not have any designated security duties. And there you go. So that in a nutshell is your STCW. Your STCW will usually span over the course of a week to two weeks and as we mentioned in previous roles will span anywhere from $500 to $1,100. So now that you have a better understanding of the STCW training course and what you'll be doing, let's now talk about your ENG1 medical. So your ENG1 medical certificates are essential for any super yacht or ship crew member. Only MCA approved doctors are qualified to take ENG1 medical examinations. So why do you need an ENG1 certificate? Well, an ENG1 medical certificate declares you are fit and healthy to safely engage in the duties associated with being a super yacht crew member. The ENG1 medical examination ensures that the crew, mem crew member does not have any medical conditions that may jeopardize the safety of other crew members or passengers on board. Certain medical conditions may be acceptable for specific jobs on board a vessel and others may not. For example, a colorblind crew member will not be fit to look for lookout duties on the bridge on board a super yacht, but may still be fit for duties in other departments. A crew member's ENG1 certificate will either state that the crew member is fit with no restrictions, fit with restrictions or unfit for work. Now, how long does your ENG1 medical last? Well, crew members have to renew the certificate every two years. Some may be every year if they have certain health restrictions. It is important to plan ahead when it comes to booking an appointment for an examination as there are a limited amount of MCA qualified doctors in the world. You will find ENG1 doctors in Fort Lauderdale, Antibes, the UK and other super yachting or maritime hubs around the world, but it is still important to plan ahead. 
especially with the busy schedules of yacht crew. Not having the certificate in time could cost you a job, so make sure you don't get caught out. So, now that you have a better understanding of the minimum training needed, such as the STCW and ENG1 Medical, let's now move on to further training courses that you can take. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next video. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the next video. Before we can continue to the additional training crew can do, let's quickly address one frequently asked question. Can you find work if you do your SCCW training and do not do position specific additional training? Well, the short answer is yes. After speaking to countless decans and stewardesses over the years, the majority can agree on one thing that majority of your roles and responsibilities are learned on the job. In general, all super yachts follow the same working practices and guidelines. Some systems may be different and you will learn your position specific duties whilst on board. Many crew have flown down to a super yachting hub with the bare essentials and, have and many have found work. This is extremely more common amongst stewardesses. So to easily answer this question, let's break it down into three points you need to consider and ask yourself. Number one, do you have the money? Number two, do you have the time? And number three, are you serious about this becoming a career for you? So let's talk about point number one, do you have the money? These additional super yacht courses are not cheap. The average course can range from 200 to 800 euros per course and taking into consideration you still have flights to pay for, visas and accommodation to cover, this can really all add up. So depending on your budget, you can answer this question for yourself. It's important to set yourself apart from the rest, however, if your budget doesn't allow this, don't feel like you are not qualified enough to find your first job on board a super yacht. Often enough, all the job depends on is the right person being in the right place at the right time. Number two, do you have the time? Depending on when you have discovered the super yacht industry and your life affairs, the amount of time you have is important because to do a lot of the additional training can take up quite a bit of time. Time you could be spending dock walking, networking or putting yourself out there whilst in a super yacht hub. Many people have simply not had enough time, so they have flown down to a super yacht hub, done their STCW training while they were there, which allowed them to start networking and meeting people at the same time. So this is for you to decide. Number three, are you serious about this becoming a career for you? Now we know this may be a little tricky as it's hard to judge if something may be a career for you if you have never done the job before. So this is up to your own interpretation and preferences. If you feel like this is your future, doing all the necessary additional training courses would be a very wise investment into your future and it can also help you progress through the ranks a lot quicker. Yachting is all about right place, right person, right time. You could definitely find work with a minimum training and it has been done many times in the past. So now that, you, so now that we have covered that, Let's move on to the additional courses available on a super yacht and how could they possibly benefit you. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the next video. So in this video, we're going to cover all the additional training courses that are available to deck crew, as well as what we think is important and therefore the ones you should do. So let's jump right in. The responsibilities of a new crew member are limited due to the industry specific experience you have when starting out on board. Super yachts are worth millions of dollars and therefore 
Until a new crew member has proven his or her worth on board as well as experience, their role will be limited to cleaning, polishing, maintenance and deckhand duties. Their role will be limited to cleaning, polishing and basic maintenance. Additional qualification not only opens up additional avenues for employment, but it can also set you apart from other crew who are eagerly walking the docks searching for that first yacht job. So here is a summary of the additional training available to you and other super yacht crew. Additional courses for deckhands are as follows. Number one, powerboat level two. This two day course covers all aspects of tender driving, close quarters handling, planning maneuvers, man overboard recovery, collision regulations, launching and refueling. Number two, standard deckhand course. Most training schools provide this course as it covers aspects of being a deckhand, including yacht maintenance and knowledge, application, washdowns, teak maintenance, general duties and line handling to name a few. As we have said in previous videos, usually everything is learnt on the job, so if you do not have the budget for this course, this shouldn't be an absolute problem. Number three, the RYA radar course. This short one day course teaches the basics of position fixing using the GPS, as well as routine safety checks around the vessel and vessel tracking on a secondary radar screen during navigational watches. Number four, VHF radio course. This short one day course touches on communications on board via crew radio. Number five, the RYA diesel engine course. This course goes through the basics of how a diesel engine operates and will give students a good understanding about it. Number six, the RYA personal watercraft jet ski course. This industry specific license touches on the basics of jet ski operations, riding skills and driving essentials. Number seven, personal watercraft instructors course. This course teaches students how to deliver a fun, safety conscious and brief course to guests and crew on board so that guests are able to drive jet skis themselves. So now that we have briefly touched on all the additional courses available, and as you can see, there are a lot to choose from. This can all seem like an information overload and a lot of money to spend, but not to worry. If you're on a tight budget, we have prioritized the most important courses we think deckhands should do. So after you have completed your STCW training, we would advise you to do the following. Your Powerboat Level 2, your Jet Ski course, along with your Jet Ski instructors. Proving to a captain that you're a competent tenor driver as well as an asset during water sports days will really set you in good stead without breaking the bank. So as we've said in previous sections, um, additional courses aren't compulsory, but they are good for setting yourself apart. Do not worry if you don't have the budget to do all of these courses. It's good to get there early and start putting yourself out there and doing as much dock walking as possible. So thank you for watching this video and we shall see you in the next one. Hello everybody and welcome back to the next video. In this video we will cover the additional courses available to stewardesses and the ones we recommend based on speaking to countless stewardesses. From junior roles to senior roles, stewardesses are collectively responsible for the everyday running and smooth operation of the yacht's interior and guest hospitality. As such, the role covers everything from serving and entertaining guests to laundry and full housekeeping duties, and even accounting responsibilities. It's important to note that no other training is mandatory for interior crew, but for stews determined to get ahead in the race and see this as a career, there are industry recognized interior crew training courses to improve your chances of landing a job on a super yacht. One route to interior training is the Professional Yachting Association's guest program, which includes the STCW and ENG1 requirements within a 
its modules, making it a worthwhile investment in your first month or two working abroad. The PYA guest program provided by the Professional Yachting Association stands for Guidelines for Unified Excellence in Service Training and it offers stewards and stewardesses a clear training route leading to an industry recognized certificate of competency within a carefully designed career path for interior crew. Some of the other additional stewardess courses that are offered are food safety and catering, super yacht flower arranging, and wine courses at various levels, as well as barista courses. As mentioned previously, stewardess job opportunities are more readily available and no other additional training is compulsory. However, we would recommend doing the PYA guest program as it includes the STCW and ENG1 Medical within its modules. Ladies and gentlemen, now that you have a better understanding towards training certifications for stewardesses, in the next video we will talk about skills that will, that will aid you in your search for your first job. Thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back to the next video. In this quick and short video, we will discuss previous work experience that will aid you and be extremely beneficial in your hunt for your first job on a super yacht. Yacht crew are an extremely social, practical and hands-on group. They must have the ability to be quick thinkers, very positive thinkers and have an unbelievable work ethic. For deckhands, if you have any carpentry experience, this will help you find a job very quickly. Carpenters on larger super yachts are in extreme demand as there isn't a high supply of them in comparison to the average deckhand. So, if you have any carpentry experience and have the qualifications and the knowledge to back it up, make absolutely sure you highlight this on your CV and in your interviews. Other skills which will be beneficial to deckhands are skills such as water sports, sailboarding, surfing and windsurfing, and diving is also very helpful for boats that are heavily water sports orientated and will make you more valuable to the super yacht. In the stewardess department, as this position is extremely and heavily service driven, skill sets such as hospitality experience and therapies such as manicures, pedicures, massaging, hairstylists will all be an asset to a super yacht as well as au pair services and nanny experience. If you have worked previous jobs in these fields, you need to make sure you are advertising and highlighting these skill sets on your CV and in job interviews so that you can set yourself apart and show that you can be of extreme value to any recruiter looking to hire you on board their super yacht. There you have it ladies and gentlemen, we hope this short video was helpful and we will see you in the next one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the new module. So in this module, we're going to be speaking about everything you need to know about visas, the visa process and the different types of visas that you get. 
Now, the visa process is arguably the most important piece of the entire job in the hunt process. It is crucial to have the correct visas for the countries that you will visit. We can advise you on the visas and application requirements to prepare for on your trip and employment on yachts. However, a quick disclaimer, Super Yacht School is not a placement or travel agency. We are a training platform and we cannot be held liable for any misunderstandings. In later sections, we go into greater detail about all of this. Having the correct visa also serves as a selling tool when you go for interviews with captains. They will not employ you if you do not have the correct visas. Firstly, it is essential to have an up-to-date passport with free pages available for stamps and visas, as the last thing you want or need is to run out of space in your passport mid-season. So in this module, we will advise you on all the requirements, correct documents, application process, where to go, how to go about getting visas once employed on yachts, and we will put you in touch with the visa experts. It's important to remember that no matter how well, you are, how well you prepare yourself for a visa application or a visa appointment, there is never a guarantee that you will get a visa. This is solely up to the consulate you're applying at. The need for getting a visa will depend greatly on where you're from, where you are going and the passport or passports you have in your possession. So for example, South Africans who are flying to Antibes to start their job search would have to get a Schengen visa in hand or if they flew to Fort Lauderdale they would need a B1, B2 visa. If you do not have any visa restrictions that you are 100% sure of, you can skip to the next module. Otherwise, we will see you in the next video where we speak about the different types of visas in more detail and who we need to make use of. See you guys in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back to the next video. In this video we're going to be talking about the Schengen visa and how it actually works. So to kick things off, what is the Schengen visa? The Schengen visa is necessary for non-European and non-British crew. It allows you to move freely between 26 European countries that make up the Schengen zone. It can be obtained from the embassy of your first point of entry into Europe. So, when talking about the Schengen visa, there's a couple of extremely important aspects you need to understand. Now, the first one is the 90 day rule. Now, this can be quite a confusing concept for many to grasp, so we will try to explain it as simply as possible. For any non-European and non-British crew, the maximum time you can spend in the Schengen area is 90 days. That is it. So this means you're allowed to be on land in the Schengen zone for 90 days within any period. So you may be asking, what do you mean with any, within any period? Well, based on a number of factors, this will affect the length of your visa. So the length of visas that consulates issue can be for three months or six months or one year, etc. If it is your second time applying for a Schengen visa and you have employment papers, you have a good chance of getting a one-year visa, then thereafter a two-year visa and so on. However, regardless of your visa length, you can still only spend 90 days on land within, an, within a 180 day period in the Schengen area. So to explain this, basically you can only spend three months consecutively within a six month period. Most people think that the 180 day period starts on the day your visa becomes valid. However, this is not true. Your 180 day period starts on your first day of arriving in the Schengen area. So you may be thinking, I don't get it. If I receive a one year visa, what's the point if I can only spend three months in the Schengen area? Well, that's where getting stamped out comes in. So what does it mean to get stamped out? Getting stamped out is a process whereby an agent or customs will stamp your passport to say that you're no longer on land as you're now boarding your ship and will be out at sea. Due to the fact that you are out at sea, nobody owns the sea 
and therefore you do not need a visa for it. Seafarers do this process to freeze their 90 days so that they can remain in the Schengen area for the duration of their visa. So it is extremely important that you don't overstay your 90 days and you get stamped out before your 90 day ends which will allow you to stay the duration of your visa however long that visa may be. However, this is where the tricky part comes in for new crew because to get stamped out you need to have boat papers to say you're either temporarily or permanently employed on the boat. This is where crew run out of time on their visa and have to go home and then renew their visa. This is a process you don't really want to follow as it's expensive and time consuming. So now let's explain getting stamped in. So once you are going to leave the Schengen area and or you are flying home, you will then return to said agent and get stamped back in. If you get stamped back in uh, and remain in the Schengen area, you will continue to use up your 90 days. So when you get stamped out, your 90 days freezes. When you get stamped in, your 90 days starts getting used up again. When you start on a yacht, you need to stamp out to stop your visa from expiring. When you start on a yacht, you need to stamp out to stop your 90 days from expiring, after which your visa will remain valid for as many days as were left on the day you got stamped out. If you do not do this and you consume your 90 days, you could be classified as an illegal citizen and when you go to the airport to fly home, you could be facing a ban. So it is extremely important to be aware of your 90 days and how long you've been using them for. So just to get a better idea of the Schengen visa, here is one of our old ones for your reference. As you can see, there is the passport. So on the bottom page on the left hand side, you have the picture which we've taken out. Then you'll see the date that your visa got given and then next to it, the 25th of the 10th, 2017, that is when your visa will expire. So as you can see in this visa, this visa is valid for one year. It is a multi-entry visa. This is important to know because multi-entry means you have access to all the Schengen areas. So when you're applying for a visa, it's very important to go for the multiple entry visa. Then to the right of that, you can see clearly 90 days. So within a one year period, so within a one year period, this person is only allowed to be in the Schengen area on land for 90 days. So what this person would have done is they would have arrived in the Schengen area, taken their boat papers, gone straight to an agent and then got them stamped out to maintain their 90 days and not using them up. Once they are now stamped out, they can stay in the Schengen area for one year, which will expire on the 25th of the 10th, 2017. This visa was issued in Johannesburg and yeah, then if you look at the top of the page, here you can see stamps. So these are the stamps, there's one right at the top there which is upside down. This one is getting stamped out. Uh, this one is this one's actually leaving an airport and getting stamped out. The one below it is getting stamped in on a vessel and the one on the right hand side is actually leaving the airport. So now that you have a better idea of what it will look like and the importance of getting stamped in and out, this will then take us to the next important part. So if you go below this video, we have attached a PDF document. This is an extremely important document as it gives detail to all the places crew members can have their visa stamped out and the exact documentation you would need to do so. So make sure you look at this video, make sure you look at this document below the video so that when you do eventually get employment and based on your area you know exactly where to go and what to take to get stamped out. So now that we have spoken about the Schengen visa, the 90 day rule and what it means to get stamped in and out, in the next video we will talk about what to do if you accidentally overstay your days. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Hello everybody and welcome back. So in this short video, 
We are just going to touch on a couple of things as in the next video we introduce visa professionals who can explain all these concepts to you in greater detail. So first up, we will just touch on what to do if you overstay your 90 days. In the highly avoidable event that you accidentally overstay your days, seafarers organize and get something called a transit visa. A transit visa exists so that you can get to the airport and go straight home without any issues so that you can then reapply for a visa. Now, that's not to say that you are guaranteed a visa, it's just very, very good to show that you went through the extra measure to get a transit visa to get home. If you're in France, the best people to use are Catalano Shipping Services. If you need the help of an agent, you can contact Catalano Shipping at https www.catalinashipping.com. We have included these links below the video. Then we're going to just briefly touch on the B1, B2 visa. Now, the B1, B2 visa is an extremely tricky visa to obtain as the American consulates are very strict. This visa is crucial if you're a non-American crew member applying for positions on internationally flagged vessels cruising in the US waters. The visa can be valid anywhere from 1 to 10 years depending on your situation and nationality. It's important to understand that this visa does not allow you to seek a job whilst in the USA or to be employed on a US flagged vessel. It simply allows you to cruise in US waters and to transit to the USA Customs to and from your superyacht. For more information regarding the B1-B2 visa application process, make sure you see the next video. Next up, we have the Siemens Discharge Book. A Siemens Discharge Book is a record of a Siemens service. This document certifies that the person holding is a Siemen as per the STCW regulations. Once you are employed on a vessel, you may apply for a Siemens Discharge Book from the flag state of the vessel on which you are employed. This may be useful for tax purposes, flight discounts and baggage preferences and in certain circumstances it may even act as a passport if you do not have the necessary visa for a certain area. So ladies and gentlemen, now that we have gone through all of the details of the different visas and concepts, let's move on to actually applying for these visas and how to make use of visa professionals. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next video. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the final video of Module 4. In this video, we're going to talk about something extremely important and beneficial to new super yacht crew. As we have explained in previous sections, the importance of doing the visa process right from the beginning will really help you start things off in the correct way. So when it comes to applying for a visa, we recommend making use of visa professionals. Not only do they have experience in handling hundreds of crew members visa applications, they are not expensive and they are professionals in handling these sensitive cases. They have also built relationships with consulates and can offer crew looking at getting a job a 6 month working Schengen visa. This is extremely extremely invaluable to you as in the past crew members would have to tell the white lie of applying for a 3 month holiday visa and then flying to Superyacht Hub to look for work. So a 6 month working visa is definitely the way to go. So now you might be asking, okay so I apply for a visa and I get a 6 month visa and then what? What happens when I get a job? So let's explain this. So what happens is you fly to Superyachting Hub, you network, day work and build experience on your CV until you eventually get that job on a Superyacht. Then, once you have landed your job, you would then get the boat to give you the correct paperwork where you would then take this to an agent to get stamped out onto your boat. So this process all remains the same, however there is one thing that has changed and this is once your visa expires. So in the past, a couple of weeks before your visa would expire, you would call the visa professionals who would give you a list of paperwork for your captain to fill in. 
Once everything is correct, you would then courier your passport home whilst still remaining on the superyacht. They would then act as a third party proxy for you and do the, ex the visa extension application process for you. This unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, is no longer allowed. The Schengen consulates have stopped this and now once your visa runs out, you would then have to fly home to do the application process yourself. However, the visa professionals still fulfill the same role and will help you throughout this process and will help you get the visa done ASAP so that you can return to your vessel as quickly as possible. We highly recommend using the services of a visa professional. So as you can see, it's extremely important to get the correct visa from the beginning, otherwise you might have to be returning home sooner than you have hoped. Now, when it comes to making use of visa professionals, we recommend only one agency and that's Global Yachties who are based out in Antibes. Their sister company is also based in South Africa and are absolutely brilliant in what they do and have helped thousands and thousands and thousands of new crew over the years. They are a very, very good brand and are well known for helping crew efficiently. We have left the contact details down below so you can get your visa application process going as quickly as possible through them. They will tell you what paperwork you would need. And then, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of this visa module. So thank you very much for watching. We hope it all makes sense. Please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask us and we will see you in the next module. Hello everyone and welcome back to the next video. In this video, we're going to be discussing all about how to create your first ever super yacht CV. How exciting. So let's jump in. The yachting industry sees one of the highest turnover rates of staff than any other industry, yet there are still less jobs than there are applicants, meaning there's often strong competition for all yacht jobs from both new and existing crew. As such, it's important to ensure your CV stands out from the pile on the captain's desk. Your CV is the only thing that can represent you when you are not there in person. It's your ticket to a phone call, an interview and day work. Typically, you have between 3 and 6 seconds to catch the captain's attention. Captains don't have long to look through applications, so your CV needs to be a maximum of 2 pages to stand the best chance of landing that yacht job. As an inexperienced crew member seeking your first job on board a super yacht, it is imperative to have a great CV. It is an extension of yourself and it needs to be unique and professional. Yacht CVs are very different to those used in the business world and other industries. It is important to make sure your CV is professional, relevant and that it stands out from the rest. We highly recommend you follow the tips we are going to mention in this video. But don't be afraid to make some adjustments that reflect your personality and your style. So this is a great example of what the ideal super yachting CV will look like. Generally, a CV is split into five. A CV is split into five parts: your photograph, your personal information, your career objectives, your qualifications and experience, and finally your references. So let's start off with a photograph. Your photograph is one of the most important, and if not, your photograph is one of the most, if not the most, important thing on your CV. Unlike other industries, no one will even bother to look at your CV without a photograph. The yachting industry is very image conscious, and boats like to hire presentable looking crew. The photograph should be placed in the top right corner of the CV. It should be in color, be a JPEG file and be less than 500 kilobytes. It should be a head and shoulders photo and you should be wearing a white polo shirt. Your hair should be neat and presentable and you should not have any hats, caps, sunglasses or large earrings visible in the picture. Look professional and friendly, have a big smile and you should take the photograph with a sea or a marina in the background. They absolutely love that. Then, in your personal information section, 
the following information should appear. Your full name, your current mobile number, location and email address. And just a side note, be very, very, very sure that your mobile number is the correct one. You won't believe how many crew members missed that phone call because their phone number was incorrect. So the other points are your nationality, the details of any visas that you currently hold with the expiry dates next to them, your marital status, your smoking habits, if you have any visible tattoos and piercings. Then you have your career objectives. Try to sound confident in yourself and be believable without sounding generic like everybody else. Focus on your strengths. Keep it relevant and professional and it's important to note that this section is not about your hobbies or interests just yet. Then you have qualifications. Under qualifications you would list all the relevant maritime courses you have done. Keep it to the point and relative to the super yacht training you have done. Then you would have your maritime experience. If you don't have any permanent experience to add, you would then put your recent day work experience. And if you don't have any day work experience yet, make sure to put your previous employment there. It can be the job you have done before yachting and or any university degree you have just obtained. Then under interests. This is your only chance to highlight your personality and yourself. So keep it interesting, relevant and don't get too personal. Also, it's important to not lie. If you have never done water sports before, don't claim to be an expert. Then underneath that would be your relevant references. So now that you understand the template and the format of the CV, let's go over a couple extra tips that are important to note. Keep your, C your CV concise and clear, and it should be no longer than two pages. Two pages meaning back to front, not two separate pages. It's very important to keep it short and sweet. Potential employers will be reading through many CVs and don't want to read unnecessary information. Also, always spell check your CV. Allow family and friends to proofread it to make sure it is grammatically correct. Write professionally and do not use slang and always print your CV out before sending it off. Sometimes layout and format may appear differently once printed. Most potential employers will print out the CVs they are interested in. Make sure you are happy with a printed version. Save your CV. Also, save your CV under a professional file name, example, Fraser Hutchinson CV, as it will appear that way for potential employers to download. And then this brings us to our top tip. And do not forget to take a quick look over your social media accounts before applying for any new yacht job. Always ensure that any and all negative comments and inappropriate photographs are removed or deleted from your social platforms or that settings are switched to private. Failing to do so could mean that you never even make it to the interview stage and it is not uncommon for potential recruiters to go over your social media accounts. Also, before you leave, it's important that you type out your CV and have the template ready. So as you gain more day work and valuable experience, you can then quickly add it to your CV and then it can be easily updated on crew agents' websites. So many people waste time typing out their CVs and signing up for crew agents when they are there. These are both long tasks and waste time as you could be networking or dark walking. Then once your CV is done, check your information thoroughly and most importantly make sure your cell phone and your references your reference numbers are correct a cv is very personal thing containing a lot of personal information including phone numbers working life and email addresses so just be mindful on where you leave your cv and who you give it to another great idea is to have a business card done in the same way your cv is these are great as you can fit it into your wallet and come in real handy if you meet someone on the go or on, on a night out and you do not have your CV on you. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope this video has helped you understand how to write a super yacht CV. Enjoy the process as, as it is an exciting one and once this is done, you are one step closer to a job on a super yacht. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next video.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. So now that you have done all of your necessary training, have your visa in order, and have created your first ever super yacht CV, it's time to start signing up with crew agents and uploading all your necessary documents. Now, crew agents are placed throughout the world to assist crew in finding employment. Crew members join their agency and they assist you in finding a job on board. Yachts will pay them a small fee to provide them with suitable crew members for positions on board. Yachts will pay them a fee to provide them with suitable crew members for positions on board their yachts. It is important to note that crew agents can assist you, but they are not the only way to find employment on board. Many super yachts do not use crew agents because they must pay them a substantial placement fee and they can just simply post the job on Facebook. For this reason, your most important way of finding a job is going out there and promoting yourself and your qualification to yachts by day working, dock walking tirelessly and networking. One of the biggest mistakes new crew make is saving this process for when they arrive. Signing up for crew agents take a long time and is a tedious and monotonous task as every site you have to type the same by. Signing up for crew agents take a long time and it's extremely tedious and monotonous task as every single website you have to do the same bio and individually upload every single document. When you arrive, you should be signed up to most agencies so you can use your time going to visit them and letting them know who you are. So attached below this video is a link for a comprehensive list of a lot of crew agents to sign up with. So to make sure to check out the link below the video. Now, to make it easier for you, we're going to show you the procedure for signing up with a crew agent. For all crew agents, the sign up procedure is similar and fairly simple. So we're going to show you how to sign up with two crew agencies just to give you an, an idea. So let's jump right in. What's happening guys? So in this video, I'm just going to quickly show you guys how to actually sign up with a crew agent. And to do this, we are going to go with Blue Water Yachting. I think it's good that you guys just get a feel for what you have to do to sign up with these crew agents and just to show you how long the process can actually be and um, it's a little bit of monotonous when you have to upload every single individual file but um, I just thought it'd be a good video for you guys to see. So we're going with Blue Water Yachting. Blue Water Yachting is probably one of the, the biggest crew agents um, out there. Um, to be honest in total I think in the world there's over there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crew agents. So in that um, document that we've linked below the video, we have between 25 to 30 of the, the most well-known crew agents. But uh, definitely one of the best, best, best crew agents are Blue Water Yachting. And we actually see now that they have updated their site. This is pretty nice. So um, when we're signing up with Blue Water, we would go over to Crew Services and go to Jobs. This would then take us directly to the job board, which I see they've updated now, and you can actually just go ahead and just directly apply for jobs, which is quite cool. So if you see on the top right hand side, it says login and register. So we are new crew, we're going to click register. Give that a bit of time. Perfect. So you'll just put in your details there. I'm just going to say JSYS. Uh, yeah, cool. huh. Perfect. We're going to click next. It's going to ask us for a quick password. We're just going to go with and hit register. Perfect. So now that we've got our password in, um, or how most of these agents work yeah we'll accept that so how most of these agents work is um, they'll normally take you to they normally fu all function on a, on a type of dashboard which gives you access to updating information and uploading documents and putting in your bio and what you're looking for so we have now signed in so let's go over to looking for work and then we're going to click go to my account so most of them work the same way. You have your own personal account and a dashboard. Here we go. So please excuse us that the site has changed a lot. 
So we're just navigating it through with you guys. So this is the new Blue Water dashboard. So here we go. So this is where you'll put all your personal information and what you're looking for. And it will sh we'll go through that process now with you. So they make it pretty clear. Update your profile. You have your yacht jobs where you can start applying for jobs. Training courses that you may be enrolled in. And there's your personal account with some uh, details. So let's on over, head on over to update profile. Perfect. So then this will take us here to our crew profile. So we're going to click edit profile. And then we'll just start putting in our details. For the sake of not boring you guys to death, we're just going to make up some details here and briefly just summarize everything. So current situation, um, available, we're going to go for still looking. So you see that which are still looking and still looking confidential. You could set be, for example, two things. You could be on your yacht and not exactly happy, but you wouldn't want to resign without having another job lined up. So crew agents often give you the chance to still look for other work, but confidentially. So they won't phone your captain for a reference or anything like that. And alternatively as well, um, this is quite, quite handy. So this is the agreement between you and the, the crew agent. Then availability, you can either be available right now, um, they can either be available after a notice period. So majority of yachts, how they work is, if you wanna resign from the, the yacht, you have to give a month's notice. If you don't give a month's notice, the yacht then has the right to withhold um, that month's salary and or any holiday costs that you have accrued whilst working on the boat. So they always like to go by a notice period so that they also have a month to look for another crew member to replace you. On, on a certain date, could be at the end of your contract and on rotation. So those are different availabilities. We're just gonna say now, please specify where you are. We're just gonna pretend we're in Antibes. Antibes. Experience, no experience. Tell us what you're looking for. That's when you'll just briefly say what it is that you want. Yeah, you're looking for your first job and you don't know where you, don't mind which boat you work on or you're looking for a 40 meter, this size, whatever, whatever. That is all, um, all depends on you. Contact details, you'd punch all your contact details in there. Choose your country, passport to nationality, you would put your passport number, your country of birth, your passport's expiry date, the visa that you have, country of birth, your city of birth, etc. etc. Additional contacts, next of kin. Then you'll have personal information if you're married or not, if you suffer from seasickness, tattoos and piercings. Um, then you can go on to languages. Any languages you're confident in speaking, um, and here's your position wanted. So you'll most likely go for deck, deckhand, or interior, just a stewardess, and whatever. Your preferences, you can click all of these. You can click motor, seasonal, um, freelance. That's completely dependent on you. They give you an option here to actually put the yacht size you're looking for, um, your minimum salary. This is all dependent on the person. Obviously, if it's your first job, you won't be too fussy in the whole process. He has your qualifications that you'll that you'll plug in. He has any other other qualifications you might have. So let's hit save. We'll just save that little bit of information that we have entered in. And usually on the left hand side here, it will give you a whole bunch of options to choose from. So I'm just gonna go back back to the account. So just say looking for work. Go to my account. Um, crew account and there we go create an account we probably should have done that first but it's okay we've, we've already jotted in our personal information so this is what I basically wanted to show you guys so here you'd be able to put in what we were doing earlier update your profile check in so what a lot of the crew agents do is I know how blue water works is they get so many crew members updating and uploading their files and the blue water just has such a big database of crew so when they get jobs handed into them they for example let's say they get a deckhand job there's just so many deckhands to choose from they can tend to look for the deckhand that's at the top of the list so what's very very important is that you check in regularly with crew agents so if you see the option here check in because what this does is this puts you top of the list and you can up you can check in once a day uh 
twice a week you can check in three times a day if you if you're a bit um, OCD but um, it's very very important to check in regularly just to put yourself at the top of all the masses so this is a very very good strategy for um, putting yourself at the top of the crew agents database then you can update your, your crew profile upload documents update your job history if you've changed and if you're in a couple and looking for a couple's position so just to make it easier for you guys jot in your basic details and then on the left hand side you'll see crew profile documents experience in a couple so let's go over to documents this is one of the processes I wanted to show you guys just to show you that this process does take a long time and can tend to be a bit monotonous so um, as we spoke about in previous um, modules your CV voter photo is extremely important another reason and not only because it goes on your CV but you add it separately so here's your CV and here's your photo so often captains or crew uh, captains or recruiters looking for a potential crew they'll hop onto the crew agency database and look at your photo so this is a good way to have a zoomed in and an enlarged photo so over here you would upload your photo you would upload your CV and then you would go and upload all of your references then from there you would upload your certificates and if you're in the galley you'd upload that so just to show you quickly so you just click it's as simple as this add choose file and from there you'd be able to choose one of these files let's just click on this just to see what that is yeah let's click that one choose there we go it's uploaded it and then you would just hit upload so it's as simple as that but the issue lies with it is extremely time consuming um, activity to do it really really does take a while so let's just wait for this to upload another thing is depending on your Wi-Fi and where you're staying um, you need to have quite quick Wi-Fi to upload all these files it will definitely help you get this process done a lot quicker so let's just wait a couple seconds while this uploads sorry for the delay but yes, yeah, so now you've got a you've got a bit of a, a good feel for how this one works. Um, we're quickly going to go through to I want to do one more with you guys, a crew agency called YPI. Um, I'll show you how they work and how they're similar to this. And once you know how to do two, they're all pretty much the same, and uh, that should set you in good stead. I don't know why this is taking so long. Hopefully, sometime before Christmas, this will be done. There you go. We have some action. Okay, so there you go. So the whole whole time while you're updating all these folders. I'll be giving you a percentage to say how complete your overall profile is. So on the top left hand side you'll see 12% crew account, so that's how, how um, updated this um, account is with all the correct information and with everything filled in. Then if you go to experience, you have your current yacht, so then you put your current yacht experience if you have any, your yacht experience, your work experience, your references and Guys, it's extremely, extremely important that any day work you get, you hound the bosun or the officer or the captain to give you a reference because references are gold in this industry. And then your education, skills, and hobbies. Then you can go over to in a couple. So there you go. So you would just follow those simple instructions and update your profile till you see that it's 100%. And then from there, you can go over to looking for you can just go to yacht jobs and then what you can also do is start applying for jobs on the actual crew agents website so you can see there's Stu Cook private shore based if that interests you you can hit apply you would then go yep and this will tell you a little bit more about this and then you'd hit apply now just a quick word of advice guys um, we know that it's tempting to see all these jobs and you're so hungry for your first job you just want to apply for anything and everything that comes up thinking that you'll make a plan on the way it is good however if you're a deckhand looking for a deckhand position don't go apply for stew cook positions or for galley positions or engineering positions because this will then flag your account and it will overall it will not um, sit well with the recruiters on the on blue water and um, they will we'll know that you're just applying to any and every job and this can make them not really want to help you find work. So it's very important to apply for the jobs that only that um, 
that are only designated for you and ones that you actually qualify for. Often on Facebook groups, which we'll talk about in the next video, and um, these crew agent sites, the job board will have jobs specifying exactly what they want. And often there'll be a decan that says, must have a minimum of one to two seasons experience. And then you have all the crew members who don't have any experience applying for these jobs. And this really, really annoys the recruiters. So guys, as tempting as it is, try and stay away from doing that. As you can see, there's lots of jobs here. So then you would just go ahead to apply. And as we showed you earlier, you just go apply for that job. And you'd usually get an email or something like that to say, um, if you've got the, if you, interested in the position if the person is interested in you and um, that might they'll more than likely give you a call if um, if they like what they see so that's basically everything you need to know with blue water I'm just gonna go through one more with you guys so I just quickly switched over to Lux yacht so I wanted to show you one more and this one is luxury yacht group which is another extremely popular um, crew agent in Antibes so when you land on their home page this is what you will see so pretty simple, you just go over to the top right hand side, click create an account. This then takes us to this page when you click create an account. Just gonna punch in some information. SYS, info, at super, yacht school, superyachtschool.com, phone number. So what you're gonna do with phone number is you're just gonna punch that in, type in your password from earlier and then you click crew looking for work that's the one this will take a couple of seconds so that will then they'll ask you just to register with your email link so I'm just gonna quickly skip ahead and do this. So we have confirmed our email address. Uh, we have followed the link and then logged back into our account and it has taken us to this page. So this is the process of them onboarding us. And it says, tell us about your perfect job. So I'm going for the deckhand position. So I'm gonna click deck. And then I'm gonna go for, you know, it's a tough one, junior deckhand or deckhand. It's up to your preference. I'm just gonna click deckhand. it's going to ask you, it's going to tell you your salary expectations and what you can expect. And I'm looking for a full-time position. Desired monthly wage. So they're setting the desired monthly wage at $2,875. We're going to click submit there. Okay, so once that's done, this is the luxury yacht group dashboard. So when it comes to signing up with all these different crew agents, it just takes a little bit of action and just finding your feet and learning how all of these different dashboards work. They all work similarly, but it's just a little bit of tricks and um, crannies that you just need to figure out for yourself. So this one's pretty much the same as Blue Water. About me, you're going to put in your gender, your birth date, your height, etc. <laughs> Alcohol consumption, that's a good one. Unfortunately, they don't have one that says every day. <laughs> Willing to take a drug test, yes or no, do you smoke, visible tattoos, all the general stuff, availabilities, languages, passports, team states if you're with a couple. So this is all stuff that they it's standardized and all the creations ask. So it's a little bit monotonous putting it in again and again, but um, you just have to, unfortunately one of the things you have to do. On the left hand side you see information, you see your objectives where you put your primary position and your secondary position, your skills, your salary information, and your objective statement saying what you're looking for in a career and work-wise. You would then go to your certificates. Here's where you would literally one by one, um, there it says attached files, so you'd put in the, the certificate number, the issuing authority, the certificate title, the primary license. So this is quite a long process as you can see. You would then put all of this in, click next, and then attach the file. You would do this one by one until all of your files are attached. You would then go to experience, and you would then type in your experience type, yacht-based, land-based, and then uploads, where you'd up finally upload your profile picture and your primary resume. Nice thing about Luxury Yacht Group is they, they have integrated your dashboard with your personal information and jobs. 
So there is an algorithm which can, um, which they set for you and, and send you jobs that are available right now for decades. So once your profile is 100% complete and you have your picture and your CV and everything uploaded, you can then start applying for the available jobs that Luxury Yacht Group have. So every different type of crew agent has different types of jobs available. And obviously every crew agent has different types of relationships with different captains and different boats. Therefore, they would all get different jobs. So it's very important to be signed up with as many crew agents as possible. So then you can start applying for all the different jobs available. As you see here, they spe specify the deckhand salary between is $3,500 start november 26 and location is florida um 60 meter private sailing yacht so if it's sy sailing yacht my motor yacht six deckhand plus two years exp uh, previous experience on same size vessels valid medical and sscw so they go they go into detail about exactly what they want so just make sure you tick all the boxes and you apply for the right jobs because like i said in the previous or previously if you're applying for one that says must speak chinese mandarin and you don't you're gonna piss off the crew agents. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, and that's all the jobs available there. So that in a nutshell is basically how you apply for jobs via the crew agencies and on their websites. So we really, really hope this was helpful. So thank you very much, guys, for watching this, and we'll see you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back to the next video. So in this video, we're going to talk about the different Facebook groups, the best ones to join and the purpose that they serve. Facebook is an incredibly powerful tool for socializing and staying up to date with yacht job posts. Many, many captains and boats look for crew and day works on Facebook groups as it saves them money and time by not using a crew agency. To date, there are a number of Facebook groups available to crew, and Facebook groups are a great place for crew members to ask questions, find work opportunities, ask visa-related questions, find people to stay with whilst looking for work, and so on. It really signifies yachting's large community, and due to the superyacht industry growing tremendously over the years, more purpose-specific Facebook groups have formed to organize things a little better. So to talk about the different Facebook groups, we'll split them into two, the biggest groups and the purpose specific groups. So they go as follows. The biggest Facebook groups are Antibi Yacht Crew. Now Antibi Yacht Crew is one of the oldest and first Facebook groups to get started. They are the second biggest group and have over 40,000 members. As you can see, that is a hell of a lot of members. Then we go on to Palmer Yacht Crew. Now Palmer Yacht Crew is the biggest um, yachty Facebook group by members. And as you can see on the bottom right, they have in total 50,000 members. So these, these Facebook groups are extremely, extremely big. And um, as you can see, the yachting community is no joke. Then you have the Fort Lauderdale Yacht Crew and you have Safas Unite in the Med and the Caribbean. This is for if you are South African. Then you have your purpose specific Facebook groups. These are for looking for jobs. Um, so posting jobs and for crew members to advertise themselves by putting a picture and saying their qualifications. These groups are Antibi Yacht Crew Jobs, Crew HQ slash Yachting Jobs, and Fort Lauderdale Yacht Crew Jobs. Whilst you are joining these different Facebook groups, you will start to see Facebook recommend groups. You'll start to see Facebook recommending other groups that are similar to those. Join the ones with a large amount of members, read the group rules, and keep an eye out for group posts within these groups. A great tip is to change your notification settings on the main groups so that whenever someone posts on a busy group, you'll be notified and you can be the first one to react, like, comment and apply for a job if it is a day work or a permanent position. It is also important to note that as there will be a lot of job posts daily on the groups, only apply to the jobs that are relevant to you. We know it's a lot of groups to join, 
but don't be overwhelmed. And if you see below the video, we have attached a larger amount of Facebook groups that you can join. Another great tip, which could also be a good way to find some day work that a lot of confident people do, is they put a professional picture of themselves on the relevant Facebook groups with a short description of their qualifications and their interests. This is a great way to get exposure for yourself. So be unique, be different, and most importantly, stay tr true to yourself. So ladies and gentlemen, now that you know the right crew agents to sign up with and the Facebook groups to join, it's now time to look at accommodation whilst you're staying in a super yachting hub. Thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. So now that you know the Facebook groups to join, let's talk all about accommodation when you arrive at a super yachting hub. Now, this will easily be your biggest expense and you can use a lot of money if you do not research and plan accordingly. Before you leave, it's great to have that peace of mind knowing you have somewhere to crash when you arrive. Also, for visa purposes, you'll need to prove where you're staying and book beforehand. When traveling, there are two places we recommend you stay. Crew houses and shared apartments with other crew members looking for work. Now, crew houses are one of our favorite places to stay when you arrive. It's a great place to break, to break the ice and really adjust to your new surroundings. You meet people from all over the world, you all share similar interests, and it's a great way to make friends that will last a lifetime. The best way is to stay in a crew house for a week or two, or maybe even three, find people you get along with well, and then move into an apartment together and split the costs. Crew houses range from 150 to 220 euros a week and they all have different rules and procedures. They sleep between 15 to 30 people and it's a busy, wild and fun experience. Many people get put off by the noise and parties in the crew houses and argue that they battle to get sleep. Well, not to worry, as the owners of the crew houses want you to have fun, but they usually kick out any troublemakers who are just there to party and make noises at obscene hours of the night. As fun and amazing as crew houses are, be careful to not get caught up in the socializing and partying aspect. Remember why you came down, and it's very easy to get caught up in the fun employed phase. Be careful you don't stay there permanently. They, the nice thing about crew houses is they also give you many helpful tips, along with a printer where you can have your CV printed at a discounted price, and computers you can use for free. Crew houses also get quite a lot of day work and employment opportunities sent their way. So make sure you set a good first impression and always, always be on your best behavior. Below this video, we have included all the crew houses you can stay at. We have, inclu we have included crew houses in Antibes, Palma. And so make sure you click the link below the video to see that document. So what happens if all the crew houses are full? Where will you stay then? Well, there are a couple of ways to find rent in super yachting hubs. You have booking.com and Airbnbs are also great options. However, also one of the best ways is to look for apartments adv advertised on Facebook groups. This is where people will be advertising and looking for other people to stay with them in their apartments. There will usually be one person in charge of, of the group and in charge of paying rent to the landlord and making sure that everybody pays up. However, people are constantly coming in and going out as they leave for day work or they leave for permanent work. As the rent is split per week, they need people to stay with them so they don't pay additional rent. The great thing about shared apartments is that they can tend to be a lot cheaper than crew houses if done right. So keep an eye out for these posts on Facebook and be among the first to reply and show interest or create your own post on Facebook requesting an apartment. And remember, be a clean and privacy conscious roommate. So now that we have spoken about crew houses and accommodation, let's then move on to the importance of travel insurance and that we'll talk about in the next video. Thanks for watching and see you then.
everyone and welcome back to the next video. So in this video we're quickly going to talk about travel insurance and why it's extremely important to super yacht crew. Now travel insurance is one of the most important things to buy for any trip no matter how long you're going away for. It is simply a must. When you get into it travel insurance itself can be a confusing topic however it doesn't need to be. Travel insurance is extremely important for super yacht crew as up until you land your first job on a super yacht, you are not covered. Once you are on, uh, employed on a super yacht, you then fall a part of their travel insurance and then you'll be fully covered. But up until that point, you are not. Travel insurance is needed for crew members who are also applying for visas. Travel insurance is an absolute must in the application process and consulates will not issue a visa unless you have travel insurance. So. To show you the importance of travel insurance, we'll also answer some of the frequently asked questions to paint a better picture for you. So to start off with, what the hell is travel insurance? So basically, it's emergency care when things go unexpectedly wrong. Depending on the policy you buy, it can be there for when your luggage is lost by the airline, or when you fall hiking, your cell phone or laptop gets stolen, you pop an eardrum while scuba diving, you get a parasite bite overseas, or you need to cancel or cut your trip short because somebody in your family has died. It's designed to be there for accidents and unexpected events you never thought could happen to you. It's not a substitute for health insurance back home, an open checkbook to supplement your trip expenses, or a license to be foolish. So is travel insurance just like health insurance? And no, it's so much more than that. While there is a medical component for sudden illnesses and accidental injuries, it can also cover you for trip cancellations or interruptions and lost or theft of gear as we've mentioned above. But most importantly, it's there for if emergency transportation is needed and you need to get to the nearest hospital fast. It's important to note that medical, it's important to note that simple medical activities such as checkups or doctor visits, they are not covered. Travel insurance is there as a backup for a serious emergency. So to basically sum this up, we have used travel insurance for many, many years now, and it's helped us out a lot of times, as well as fellow crew members who have come through this course and readers of our site. We cannot stress the importance of this enough. Travel insurance is an important safeguard against the unexpected, and nobody ever expects the worst. Our favorite and preferred company is a company called World Nomads. We have been using them since 2013. They are a very reputable company and their claims are quick and fairly processed. To add to this, they ensure people from all over the world. What's also great about them is their online feature whereby you can generate quotes instantly on the site and this can really save you a lot of time. So to show you this, we're quickly going to switch to this and show you exactly how it works. All right, what's happening everybody? So we are just on the World Nomads homepage. As you can see at the top of the screen, it is www.worldnomads.com. Um, but not to worry, we have included the link below this video for you to click on. So I'm just gonna quickly show you how you can get a price for travel insurance, just so you can see how easy it is and how well priced they actually are. So when you're on the homepage of World Nomads, you're gonna go to the top and click travel insurance. From there, it gives you a little intro into what travel insurance is. You're going to click on get a price and that will then take you to this widget over here. And the thing that I like about this is with a lot of travel insurances, you have to fill in all your information, fill in long forms and then click request a quote and then they'll only get back to you. The nice thing about this is it gives you a price straight away. So let's say, for example, you are flying from London to Antibes and you just need travel insurance for a month because you feel like that's when um, that's how long it'll take you to land your first job. So let's put that in. So which countries or regions are you traveling to? We're going to say France. And let's say in case you dock walk in Italy. Let's say Italy. What's your country of residence? Let's just say England. United Kingdom. So the start date. Let's say you're going in the middle of the busy season. Let's say you go from beginning of April, the Monday, to the end of April. Your age, let's say you are 25. And then, easy as that, you just click get a price. 
As you can see, the algorithm is busy working it out, building your quote. And you know, it's just, it's very, very nice to have this in your back of your mind to know that you are covered. Should your luggage go missing, should any of your items get stolen, should a, an emergency accident happen, it's very, very good peace of mind to know that you're covered for this sort of thing. And there you go. So as you can see, it's actually incredibly how well priced this is. So here's your entire quote, it gives you a breakdown. So for a month, traveling to France and Italy, your total would be 32 pounds. I mean, that's just, that's incredible. 32 pounds, and over here you're able to see um, what your options are and if you're and what you actually are covered for. So you can see you're covered for med emergency medical expenses, baggage, cancellations. Um, there's a few things that you aren't covered for that you could just add as like an upsell onto your, your um, insurance policy. So make sure you read all of this and really ta tailor it to um, your specifications. And there you go. So once you're happy with that, you'll click select and then you would put your card details in and it's pretty much as easy as that, ladies and gentlemen. Follow the steps to the end and um, yeah, you, it's easy as that. You're insured and you're covered and it's very, very good to have this peace of mind in the back of your head. Cool. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. So it was good to show you how quickly you can get a quote and it's very, very good to do something like that. And as you can see, it's not expensive. So it's good to have that preventative measure at the back of your head, knowing that if anything does go wrong, you are covered. So ladies and gentlemen, we hope this video has been informative. We hope we have helped you realize the importance of travel insurance. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to the last video of module 5. So up until this point, we have spoken about training, visas, super yacht CVs, crew agents, crew houses and travel insurance. This all brings us to the final step before making the big move and starting your new life. We know the feeling, it's probably going something like this. You've thrown things away, possibly sold a couple things and, you des and you've downscaled a lot and now you need to fit your entire life into a suitcase. How do you even begin? Don't worry though, we know the feeling and you know what? It's one of the best feelings in the world. The freedom that comes with being able to fit everything you own into a suitcase is indescribable. To just zip up your bags and be able to go anywhere on a moment's notice brings about the true feeling of adventure. So, a very important aspect of working on a super yacht and your hunt for a job is to pack real light. You may have that sinking feeling in your heart like you're going to forget something valuable and you won't be able to get it once you leave. But you know what? 99% of the things you worry about don't come true. So pack the essentials and remember, anything can be bought whilst you're in a super yachting hub. These are the 10 items we think you can't be without. So number one, pack the essentials. Clothing is the biggest waste of space as people tend to bring their entire closet's worth of clothes with. Closet space is very limited in crew cabins, so you won't have anywhere to store them. Opt for a few tops and bottoms in basic colors so that you can easily mix and match. Yachting is pretty, ca pretty casual, so you can leave the flashy items at home. For the job hunt, a pair of shorts and a polo should suffice. It's okay to bring at least one to two smart outfits to wear in an interview or for dinner out with an owner or guests. This brings us to toiletries. If you're particular about a certain type of brand or product, definitely bring your own toiletries. However, most yachts provide basic crew toiletries, so you don't have to go crazy packing too much before you step on board. Just have enough to get you through the job hunt if you're on a strict budget. Next is to pack your camera. Now, as you know, we are huge fans of you documenting your journey. And if you look in the bonus section of this course, we have included a complete guide from how to start your own travel blog for free. You're gonna see things most people will never see and do things most people will never do. Often you can't put into words these moments. So what better way to capture them than on a camera? If you're looking for a very, very good camera that takes beautiful photos and records an incredible 4K, we would suggest you going with a Canon M50. This camera is small and compact, perfect for your travels, and it's extremely mobile. 
we have left the link below this video on a full review so make sure you check that out and if you want something a little bit more mobile this next one would be perfect for you number three a gopro also known as a yachty's best friend the gopro is the ultimate recording tool as it's light waterproof and shoots an amazing 4k with hundreds of different modes our favorite is the gopro hero 6 and the best part is it fits comfortably into your pocket number four a kindle due to limited space we mentioned earlier and the importance of traveling light the kindle ticks all the right boxes comfortable and easy to use you can store all your favorite books on one device and access it at any time how does a good book, a cup of coffee, and being anchored off in a beautiful island sound? It will be impossible to store all of your books in your cabin, so why not read as many as your heart desires on Amazon Kindle, which by the way, has the power to store over 1,100 books. Incredible, right? This then brings us onto a laptop. Want to know what almost every single Yachty purchases with their first month's salary? Believe it or not, an Apple MacBook. It's always a joke in the industry, but Yachties tend to almost always spoil themselves with a fancy laptop after their first paycheck. Apple laptops are the leaders in the computer industry, and the best MacBook in our opinion is the Apple MacBook Pro. This then brings us to number six, a hard drive. A hard drive will most likely be the single most important item in your luggage, next to your passport. Store all of your yachting documentation, your photos and videos from your adventures, and of course, all your favorite movies and TV series while you're out at sea. Usually when boats are out at sea, they limit your Wi-Fi usage, so streaming will not be possible. So it'll be very handy to have a hard drive with all your favorite shows on it. Number seven, very important, a great pair of sunnies. Sunglasses are extremely important for a yachty, especially for deck crew who are outdoors. The glare of the sun that bounces off the ocean and the yacht are just about everywhere. Not only is not having sunglasses extremely uncomfortable and can be damaging for your eyes, we always tell deck crew to go for polarized sunglasses. These provide superior glare protection, especially on the water. Polarized lenses contain a special filter that blocks this type of intense reflected light, reducing the glare. Everyone has their own style and fashion sense. However, in the link below this video, we have reviewed a couple of our favorite polarized sunglasses. This brings us on to number eight, headphones. A good pair of headphones will go a long way, especially if there are nights when there are rough seas or a cabin mate snores like lightning. Our favorite is the, the Bose Quiet Comfort noise cancellation headphones. Number nine, a jump rope. Depending on the super yacht you work on, there can be periods during the season where you won't be able to go on land for a while. It can be frustrating not being able to go for a run, and if your vessel doesn't have a gym or treadmill on board, it can be even worse when you can't do any physical activity. A jump rope is a great way to stay in, in shape during the season and really doesn't take up a lot of space. In the link below this video, we have reviewed our favorite jump rope, which is the Wad Nation jump rope. Number 10. And finally, running shoes. Super yacht crew are an extremely active bunch, and with many super yachts having gyms on board, making it possible to work out. The locations super yachts visit in the summer are extremely incredible. When you get some time off, you'll have an opportunity to hike and run around the exotic locations. So it'd be crazy to not take some running shoes with you. For all the products we have mentioned above, you can check these out in the link below. We have written a full review on all of the above products. So ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. We hope this short list has helped you to have a better idea of what you should pack. So now that that's out the way, we'll see you in the next module where we'll talk about what to do when you finally land in a super yachting hub. See you then guys. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to module six. And in this module, we're gonna be talking about how you should go about getting your first job on a super yacht. So in this short introductory video, we'll just touch on what you should do on arrival. So when you arrive in a super yachting hub, whichever one you may choose, you should really hit the ground running. Locate places such as crew agents, 
yachty hangout spots and places to print your CVs and really try and find your way around the city as quick as possible. You really need to start dock walking and network as soon as possible so you can really start getting your name out there. Start learning the different train times and train destinations so that you can really start planning your dock walking areas and techniques. On arrival, it's important to also pick up a local SIM card so that you have an overseas phone number that you can add to your CV. In the past, we have used countless different service providers and we recommend anybody who is based in France to go with free mobile. For 20 euros a month, you can get 50 gigabytes of data a month and it's free roaming around Europe. And for anyone in Palma de Mocha, we would recommend going for Orange. So on arrival, sort out your cell phone as soon as possible, start hitting the docks so you can start picking up some day work for your CV and also start meeting with crew agents so they can start to get to know who you are. So let's now move on to day work. So for this, we will see you in the next video. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the next video. In this video, we're going to be talking about how to find day work and the power of networking. So when you arrive in a super yachting hub, it's very important to start taking action and putting yourself out there. Day work is arguably, arguably the most important catalyst to finding your first job on a super yacht. Now, day work is the process of temporarily working on a super yacht and helping crew with numerous tasks. Often before the season starts or during the season, super yacht crew would need to get the boat clean and ready for guests to come on board. And often during the season, uh, boats would just finish the guest trip and would need to get the boat uh, to be completely turned around in let's say two or three days. And to do this, they would then hire day work to help get the job done. So captains and, often, and officers will often look for extra help in the form of day crew. Day work also takes pressure off you by helping you to earn some money to pay for rent, get you boat experience for your CV and will get you invaluable references and it's very important to note that often day work leads to permanent employment. So it's very very important to note that. The day work rate is approximately 100 to 150 euros per day depending on the boat and most boats usually give you lunch and drinks whilst on board. Day work is an amazing opportunity to network yourself and is also a good way to find your niche and what you prefer in yachting. You can experience the interior work and then try some time on the deck. You can work on different size boats and generally get a feel for what you prefer. We often tell a new crew that they shouldn't be fussy or picky about their first yacht but it's just good to get an idea of what you prefer going ahead into the future. So there are three ways to find day work. Number one, through dock walking. Number two, through crew agents. And number three, through Facebook. So let's talk about the first way, through dock walking. Now, dock walking is literally the process of walking the ports and approaching boats, asking them if they have any day work or jobs available. As crazy as this sounds, this is what all new crew do and it's sort of a safe passage right into the into the yachting industry. It's what makes the industry so unique and this we'll go into more detail in the next video. So this then brings us to the second way which is crew agents. It's very important to go and see every crew agent when you arrive. However, many people argue that until you have a bit of day work and experience on your CV, they'll not be too helpful in finding you work. This is usually argued amongst, amongst people, but just a reminder that crew agents see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new crew members every single day. So you really need to try your best to stand out. It has happened in the past that crew agents have found work for people with no experience. However, this is more common in interior positions. However, there's no harm in going to see them, introducing yourself, and once you start racking up day work, it's important to update your CV and check in with these crew agents as often as possible so you stay at the top of their mind and their database. If a crew agent does find you day work or even a permanent position, make sure to show your appreciation to them by sending a small gift or flowers. This would really make their day and there is absolutely no harm in forming a strong relationship with an agent. 
you never know how they could assist you in the future. The third way is through Facebook groups. Now, during the season, the Facebook groups will go absolutely mad with job posts and day work spots. As mentioned previously, it's imperative that you turn your group notifications on so you can be amongst the first to reply to these messages. So now that you're aware of how to get day work, let's talk about the power of networking. There's a famous saying that goes, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. And this is even truer in the super yacht industry. A separate book could be written on the importance of networking, but don't worry, we will keep it short and sweet. Networking is arguably one of the most important things in yachting if you're looking for work. You will hear countless stories of how people landed a job because of their mate who knew a guy or out at a bar they met a captain. The stories are endless. Yachties are an extremely social and outgoing bunch and there's nothing more they enjoy than having a few drinks at the bar with their mates. During the season there will be yachties out and most nights and it's important to be friendly and really get your name out there. Now, just be careful to not use networking as an excuse to go out every night and get blind or drunk. Also, it's very important to get involved in as many activities as possible while you are there. Often crew agencies will host socials at bars and twice a week the boys will all get together to go play touch rugby at the fort. Socialize where you can and, have, and most importantly, have fun whilst doing it. It's also important to note that yachting is an incredibly small world with gossip and news traveling extremely quickly. Be careful not to make a bad name for yourself. It will travel the community very quickly. So now that you understand the different ways to get day work, let's go on to everything you need to know about dock walking. So for this, we'll talk about it in the next video. So see you then. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the next video. In this video, we're going to be talking all about dock walking and all the ports that you should know about. Now, dock walking is an extremely effective way of getting your foot in the door. Normally, when we tell people about what dock walking is, they normally laugh and think it's a joke. They never ever believe us the first time around, and we just here to say that dock walking is actually real. Now, dock walking is literally the process of walking along the dock going to yachts and speaking with crew with the purpose of leaving a CV, securing day work and or landing a permanent job on board. Dock walking requires a lot of courage and a lot of confidence. It takes a lot of strength of character to approach every yacht with an enthusiastic smile and to not get disheartened when you are turned down. Dock walking is also a great way of meeting and mingling with crew and captains in the hope of being employed. So the international I'm looking for work in our Miyoti symbol is the famous white or blue polo top with beige chino shorts or longs. This picture will help represent this for you. So as you can see there, that's your typical yachty dock walking outfit. This is also good for, you can also wear this on job interviews and you can also wear this outfit when you're going to go and meet crew agents. It's completely up to you. You can also wear boat shoes. These look good, but they are not an absolute must. But whatever your choice of shoes, make sure you walk them in properly before dock walking. Because as mentioned earlier, you'll be doing a lot of dock walking. So wear shoes that won't be leaving you with bloody ankles and painful blisters. Because nothing screams greeny more than plasters on the back of your ankle. So, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that your appearance is absolutely impeccable whilst dock walking. Presentation is extremely important in the yachting industry and, and it is even more important to make sure that your clothes are ironed and spotless and that your hair is presentable and out of your face. So, this then brings us to the next question. So, when dock walking, how do you actually approach the boat? Well, it's as simple as this. You will approach the boat and try to get the attention of a crew member working on board. Or alternatively, if there's nobody there, you will ring the bell. But please guys, never ever ring the bell during lunch. Not only is this rude, it will also set off, it will also, also not be a good first impression. 
Also, never ever approach a boat when they have guests on. This is a no-go. So, getting a crew member's attention can be quite daunting at first. You might feel that you're disturbing them and your nerves could tend to get the better of you. However, you need to overcome that, that anxiety. The only way you can do that is through practice and doing it over and over and over again until you overcome those nerves. The more dock walking you do, the better you'll get at it. Get at it. Most crew will respond if you stand on the dock next to the yacht, give them a polite smile and wait patiently for them to get to you. Calling out to them should be avoided as you may be seen as rude or, or obnoxious. And most importantly, never under any circumstances do you shout to the crew. When you get their attention and their approach, you must be polite and smile and you can say something like, Hi there, how are you? I'm so sorry to disturb you from your work, but I was just wondering if you possibly had any day work opportunities on board. Something along these lines is always okay. You can add your own twist to it and add your personality to it. Um, but this is, a, this is fine because you are polite and to the point and you aren't wasting anyone's time as they have work to do and you've got other boats that you need to chat to. If they ask for your CV, make sure your CV is in a neat plastic sleeve. It is up to date and people don't remember photos, but they always tend to remember faces. So make sure you actually look like your photo. So this then brings us to the next, po the next point. When is the best time to dock walk? Have you ever heard the saying, the early bird catches the worm? This has never been more true than when it comes to dock walking. Try, be, in fact, you need to be the first one on the docks. Most yachts start the day at eight o'clock, so make sure you're out on the docks at by at least 7.30, 7.45. Another great time to do some dock walking is just after lunch. The crew will be more relaxed having done most of the daily work. They'll be more open to sparing a minute to talk to you and direct you accordingly. So this then leads us to the next question. In which ports do you dock walk? So below this video, we have left the link for a document of all the main dock walking spots in each super yachting hub. So please guys, make sure to check this out. One mistake many dock walking crew make is heading straight to the bigger vessels and super yachts when dock walking. They make the assumption that there will be more money and or a greater demand for more crew. What they forget is that smaller yachts might have job opportunities better suited to their skill set and experience. You are totally allowed to be ambitious, but consider how much help and guidance you can get from others when working in a small, close-knit team than trying to find your feet within a fleet of crew. You might miss out on a sure win job opportunity by underestimating the power of smaller yachts. So ladies and gentlemen, dock walking is really a numbers game. You might have a day where you manage to chat to four or five vessels. Other days might be a little slower and you only hand out a single CV. Don't get discouraged. We can't stress the importance of this enough. Almost every crew member has had to dock walk for a job. It's kind of a rite of passage. You'll often find yacht workers are friendly and understanding even when they tell you they don't need any more crew. And this is because they've been in the same position as you're in. And even if they are nasty or stand off offish, keep the faith, stay positive, have fun with it, and you will find work soon enough. So this then brings us to the end of our dock walking segment. Thank you so much for watching guys. Make sure to click on the link below this video to see the dock walking ports and we will see you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back to the next video. In this video, we're going to be speaking about when you finally land day work, what you should do and four tips to turn day work into a permanent position. So let's jump right in. Dock walking can lead to an on the spot day work offer. So go prepared and dressed for work. This is your chance to show what you can do and demonstrate your determination to succeed in a yacht crew career. Make it your mission to work the hardest you've ever worked and be relentless in showing your work ethic. Day work positions will help you meet new crew, gain new contacts, 
Experience how things differ across various boats and gain experience and that is always valuable no matter how much experience you already have. When you do land some day work, here are four tips to make your day work turn into a permanent position. Number one, don't be late. As obvious as this sounds, make sure you are on time. Being late simply speaks volumes about your character. Those who show up late appear disorganized, unmotivated and uninterested. If you have to catch a train to your day work port, make sure you take the second earliest train as trains have a reputation for being late and delayed. If you are going to be late, phone the appropriate contact as soon as you even suspect you might not be on time. Apologize, explain the reason without blaming anyone or anything, show sincerity and determination to arrive as soon as possible and you may win back some valuable points. Number two, be open-minded. Everything in yachting is relative to the type of yacht, the owner, whether it's private or chartered, and so on. Your way of doing things from previous experience may be the polar opposite at this new gig. Understanding this and showing your potential boss that you're willing to adapt and fit into their methods and routines is super, super important. It's extremely, it's also extremely important to know that in the yachting industry, no two yachts are ever, ever the same. Number three, show your personality whilst remaining professional. Yachts are interesting locations to work on. You're often plunged into a very formal environment, so professionalism is key. When existing crew know that they're looking to turn a day worker full time, they won't just be looking at how you work, they'll be looking at how you are. Should you be made permanent, you'll be sharing a room with one of them. Being a good day worker is one half of the equation, being a good housemate is the other. Don't be unprofessional, but ensure that crew get a good idea of what you're like as a person and they get to know your personality. Take every appropriate opportunity to introduce yourself to someone new and get to know as many people as you can even if it's just a little bit. Making an effort to gel with existing crew will really get noticed every single time. Number four, treat the day as a long interview or trial shift. It's important that you be hands-on, keen and willing to show initiative, but remember your limits. You're still very much a guest on the boat at this time. Go the extra mile to make sure you come across as extra polite and courteous, even if it feels a little unnatural. It will make the rest of the crew feel respected and in turn, they will respect you. If you finish the tasks assigned to you ahead of time, ask if there's anything else you can help with. If you're really good, try and spot other things that could do with some attention whilst you complete the tasks you've been hired for. And it would be good to suggest that you'd be happy to take a look at it before the day is over. Even if they've got everything covered, you'll look so good for showing that extra initiative. Finally, if you have a great day on a day working gig and don't get called back, don't take it to heart. Chances are you were great, but that particular yacht doesn't need someone full time right now. Also, sometimes a yacht may have seen three amazing day workers, all of equal capabilities and skills, so an offer went to one of them who had the most in common with the crew. These things are unfortunately out of your control and therefore they are not worth getting upset or worrying over. Keep day working, get the experience, keep on working hard, and the position will come. And guess what? And the best part is you must have fun whilst doing it. Thank you so much for watching this video, ladies and gentlemen. And that is a wrap on module six. Um, that will then take us to module seven, where we will then talk about the interview process and everything you need to know about it. So thank you so much for watching and see you in the next video. Hello everyone, welcome back and welcome to module 7. In this module, we're going to be talking about the interview process, the questions they may ask you, when to say no to a job, as well as a super yacht crew contract. So let's get started. With all interviews, first impressions are extremely important, but it's your interview technique that will get you the job. So here are some super yacht school interview tips to set you in good stead. Presentation. Present yourself well and dress correctly. 
Suitable attire is a clean polo shirt or t-shirt with a smart trousers or shorts. For women, wear your hair up, neat and tidy, wear minimal makeup with very little with very little Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this video and in this short video we will just touch on when you should say no to a job offer. Now there's a saying that goes, beggars can't be choosers and this is extremely true when you are new to the super yacht industry. If a job offer comes your way and it's not perfect, you should still take it. This is usually what we tell green stewardesses who have just been offered a position they deem as not perfect or not their dream boat. It's true that there are more stew positions than deck, as there are more interior roles and girls changing their boats more often than guys, resulting in more openings. However, but this does not mean they should wait until the perfect job comes along. A stewardess could quite easily find herself sitting with artwork, having rejected a couple of boats that don't fit in to a dream offer. In our opinion, there's no such thing as a perfect job. Jobs that you may not have such a good feeling for can end up becoming your dream job and your dream boat could easily turn into your worst nightmare. So it's extremely important that you choose carefully. However, during the season, there will be the occasional job offer that appears where the captain is highly underpaying crew members. Like for example, there can be a few Facebook job offers that come up where captains are offering deckhand salaries for between 1,000 to 1,500 euros. And just to give you a quick story from a team member at Super Yacht School, um, when they first joined the Super Yacht industry six years ago, um, obviously they were in the grind and the hustle of trying to find their first job that they so badly wanted. Um, and they saw a post on Facebook advertising a deckhand job. So when they applied for it and they pursued it, they got an email back saying that the salary was 1,500 euros. So this person had been looking for a month and a half now and was desperate for work and just wanted to be on a yacht and start working. He then went back and forth with the captain, straightening a few things out. And then only at the end, the captain said, oh, Jan, by the way, you would be uh, sleeping on a couch in the bridge. Um, you won't actually have your own cabin. So after the, the crew met, the, this person found this out, he was like, no, no, thank you. I'm not interested. So often what these captains do is they get an extra crew member on board um, the owner would give him a budget of let's say 2,500 euros. He would then hire another deckhand for 1,000 or 1,500 euros and then take the difference of the money. There's two things we recommend to new crew never ever to do. And that is never do day work for free. And we highly recommend to never take these underpaying jobs that go less than the minimum standard. Anything less than 2,000 euros we recommend you stay away from. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so that's just a wrap on this quick video. And in the next video, we're gonna be talking about crew contracts and five things that should appear on those contracts. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back to the next video. In this video we will speak about the different contracts you will be employed under. So let's jump right in. So on super yachts you have three different types of contracts. You have seasonal, permanent and temporary. Generally, generally speaking, captains, officers, engineers and senior interior crew are employed on permanent long-term contracts. Many yacht crew jobs are also seasonal. Now, typically seasonal contracts run from April to the end of September for the Mediterranean season and from October to March for the Caribbean season. Seasonal jobs are the most common for junior stewardesses and deckhands. Smaller super yachts, typically, typically those at 40 meters or less, may only run a one season program. Often they will hire crew just for the season. 
and often larger yachts who would maybe need an extra hand during the season for a month or so or let's say a super yacht crew member uh, injures himself or breaks an arm or a toe and they'd be out for a month or so what super yachts would do is then bring on somebody somebody temporarily for a month or so to join the vessel and then when the crew member is fit again um, bring him back on board so based on whether the yacht you're employed on is private or charter your contract content would change accordingly so the MLC the maritime labor convention sets out the interest of yacht crew welfare providing minimum requirements for crew accommodation welfare and employment it demands that all crew members working aboard commercial charter yachts should be hired on the basis of a seafarers employment agreement the SEA so Charter yachts are deemed commercial vessels, and as such, all potential crew on these yachts will be, be provided with an SEA, which is the proper term in the maritime world for employment contract under a charter yacht. Commercial yachts should give you the opportunity to examine and seek advice on the agreement before signing and joining the yacht. Private yachts, on the other hand, do not issue SEAs. Private yachts issue their own contracts under their own management agreement. A crew contract should set out in more detail the name and contact details of the yacht's owning company or agency, plus a description of the vessel you're about to work on. It should also include these five details for your reference. Number one, your contract should have the employer's name and address. You are entitled to know the name and address of your employer and a minimum sometimes at a minimum sometimes a phone number is also included here it's important you have a way of directly contacting your employer whilst on board should you ever need to the second thing is details of your salary and contract length your salary and more importantly how it is calculated should be detailed in your SEA for temporary contracts this must also include the end date of your contract and for permanent positions the, the conditions under which your contract will be terminated at any minimum notice period. The other thing that should be on your contract clearly stated is your paid leave entitlement. The minimum amount of holiday one can accrue under MLC rules is 2.5 days per calendar month spent on board. Some flag states may require more, but none can give less. As we've stated earlier in earlier videos, a lot of yachts uh, tend to give two months a year, some give one month a year, it's all dependent on your yacht. But um, make sure that you are getting the correct leave entitlement on board your yacht. The next thing is medical insurance agreements. You should see some sort of medical insurance provided, including benefits if you are sick or injured. This is another area where it is important to ask questions to be clear on what's covered and what is not as it will vary between different employers and locations. And finally, the last thing that you should see on your contract is your right to repatriation. At the end of your employment, or even if you're fired, the ship owner is to cover the costs of your repatriation. You cannot be made to pay an upfront fee to cover future repatriation costs when you join a vessel. You are entitled to food and accommodation until you have arrived in your previously agreed repatriation destination and 30 kilograms of personal luggage for your travels. Time spent awaiting repatriation or travel time cannot be deducted from paid leave. You are also covered against any costs incurred due to necessary medical treatment before being deemed fit to travel to a repatriation destination. The cost of this, again, is covered by the ship owner. So there you have it ladies and gentlemen, it's important to know your rights and the different types of contracts that you can get into as a super yacht crew member. Now that this module is covered and done, let's now move on to an extremely exciting section and that is what to expect when you finally land your first job on a super yacht. Guys, thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next video.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the next video. In this video we're going to be talking about what to expect when you land your first job on a super yacht. And ladies and gentlemen, when you finally crack that first gig, it really really is a great feeling. However, this is where the hard work truly begins. The fun employed stage is over and now it's time to get your head straight and work hard. Many newcomers to the super yacht industry admit that the first few weeks on the job can be tough and leave them questioning whether they've made a mistake, but those that persevere never ever look back. Most super yacht crew with a few seasons of experience will admit that working on a super yacht is no walk in the park, but I'll also tell you that all the hard work is extremely worth it. In this video, we'll talk about what to expect when you land your first job and everything from crew cabins to free toiletries. Let's dive right in. So, what to expect on the first day? Well, on your first day, you'll most likely give, be given a tour around the yacht. This is known as the familiarization process. This is great as you'll get to see the interior of the yacht, get used to the equipment on board and be introduced to all fire escapes and other safety concerns. From there, whether you're on entry level in the interior or on the deck, the rest of your day will be spent learning the ropes of your daily cleaning routine. It goes without saying that you'll need to learn your duties and the standards you'll be expected to maintain. But newcomers to super yacht life also need to learn the rules of life on board. These include being considerate of others at all times, taking shoes off in certain areas, closing doors quietly and taking care not to scratch the paint or use the wrong brush, brush or cloth or apply the wrong cleaning product. The list goes on and on and on. It really can all feel like an alien world in the beginning, but the key to success is to watch and learn and learn quickly by doing. Now let's talk about the living conditions. Crew accommodation is not as luxurious as guest accommodation. However, most super yachts have been extremely well kitted out with crew kitchens, a very cr uh, cozy crew mess, always stocked up with chocolate, sweets, food and cool drink. And it's a great place where the crew will hang out, watch TV, movies, have uh, coffee machines, you name it. Some of the largest super yachts even have their own dedicated crew gyms. Often space can become cramped on a super yacht, however it's amazing how quickly you can adapt and learn to enjoy living a more smaller, mobile, simple and less cluttered lifestyle. Although your daily schedule on board a super yacht is often regimented, there is no typical day on board a super yacht. The routines will all remain the same, but the work and the workload will change depending on the season and whether they are guests on board or not. But there is always maintenance work to be done and the yacht must always be in immaculate, immaculate condition. To put it into perspective, the rule of thumb on a super yacht is that 10% of the super yacht's worth has to be spent every single year in maintaining the yacht. So they can really think about how much cleaning and maintaining needs to be done on these super yachts. So a large part of your daily life is going to revolve around cleaning and polishing. The working hours on a super yacht are long during the season and it's the nature of the job that when the owner and guests are awake, you're busy doing everything in your power and everything you can do to make them as comfortable as possible. So to give you an idea of how things are, here is a breakdown of what to expect during the season, on and off. So, during the season with guests on. This, is, this time off is generally limited with long periods of work. You will work usually every single day and 9 to 12 hours a day are not uncommon. Work schedules are, schedules are generally more structured on larger vessels as there are generally sufficient hands for most operations to take place. But be aware that there are times that your break will be cut short depending on the operations of the vessel. Crew need to be more flexible on smaller yachts as the schedule will be structured around demanding guests. Generally, when guests are on board during the season, you'll be a part of some type of watch system and duration of the guest trip you'll follow that watch schedule. If you have a break, you'll usually not be allowed off the yacht in case you're needed or all the itinerary suddenly changes. The working schedule is always a rough outline of the hours you could be working. Don't take it as a given that you'll have certain times off. 
Guest trips tend to be extremely demanding and exhausting. They can also continue for long periods of time and put physical strain on the crew. However, it is important to remain pro professional, calm and patient. Try and focus on the positives. You, can't, you cannot spend any money. There's a possibility that you might have a tip coming. It's a great detox and really makes you appreciate your downtime that much more. During the season, if you do not have guests on board, the captain will try his best to give crew time off where he can. But keep in mind, the boat would have to be back at its best before this could happen. So then, what to expect during the off season? Now, in off season, things are a lot more relaxed and calm. And this is where being a part of a super yacht is very, very exciting. Because most yachts will work Monday to Friday with weekends off. Many crew will be granted leave or vacation during this period. If a boat is not doing a crossing, it will most likely end up tied up at the dock or taken out of the water, so all furniture, toys and equipment will be covered and stowed away. This period is known as the yard period and is an extremely important time for the vessel as it is often the only opportunity to do maintenance. However, this is a very, very fun time for crew as you usually get days off, evenings and weekends off, and you get lots of time to explore the location that you're in and often crew go and take skiing and snow trips up to the mountains. So now that you have a better idea of what to expect when you land your first job, let's move on to tips to stay hired and what to do if you're not happy on your boat. Thank you so much for watching guys and we will see you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back. So in this short video, we're going to be talking about what to do if you are unhappy on your current yacht. So ladies and gentlemen, we get this message and this question all the time. So crew join their first boat with all the expectations and dreams in the world. Then something happens. They don't like the crew. Their chief stewardess is a bitch. They bump heads with all the authority. Their working conditions aren't right and their cabin mate snores louder than a jumbo jet. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard it all, and we also understand. Sometimes a great sounding job comes along, and then, all of a sudden, it takes a turn for the worst. Often, you can stick it out until the end of the season, but oftentimes, you just simply can't. Choose wisely. If you truly foresee that you'll be on the verge of depression and can't do another day, then leave. There are so many boats out there and there are always jobs. So if your current job comes at a cost of your happiness and sanity, it just simply isn't worth it. And ladies and gentlemen, it's best then to leave the yacht. Even if it is in the middle of the season, these things do tend to happen and crew turnover does happen in the middle of the season. So rather just leave the boat and stay back in a crew house until you find your next gig. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and we'll see you in the next video. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the next video. So in this short video, we're just going to speak about how to get an offshore bank account. So to start from the beginning, why would you want to get an offshore bank account? Well, it's simple. When you are working on a super yacht and it's time for your salary to be paid into your bank account, the mistake that a lot of crew members have done in the past is that they let the captain transfer their salary to the bank account back home. Not only is this a bad idea, you also lose a hell of a lot of money. Why is that? Well, it's simple. When you earn in, let's say, euros or dollars, 
Um, it gets it gets transferred to your home country, whether it's Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, or England. And when it gets transferred, the bank picks up that there's foreign currency coming into your bank account. And what it then does is it converts into your home bank's currency at a ridiculously bad rate for you. See, obviously the banks want to make a lot more money and often the exchange rates for, with the banks are not good at all. You also need a bank account that's flexible. Super yacht crew are always traveling and they're always in different countries and they need a card that, that they can take with them. Now your home bank account, um, it's quite difficult for you to be able to swipe it everywhere and it's a mission having to inform your bank account where you are the whole time so they don't think that you're committing fraud on your bank account. So over the years there has been one dominant and prominent bank account that yachties know, trust and love. We personally at Super Yacht School love this bank account and this is the Seafarers Bank Account by Standard Bank. So with Standard Bank they provide you a unique current account available exclusively and only to Yacht Crew. The Seafarer account has a low minimum balance and no minimum income requirement. It also has an optional Visa debit card and secure 24-7 internet banking. The Seafarer account is nice because it puts you in control wherever you are in the world. There's been often times where crew members have lost their wallet on a night out or had stolen and what Standard Bank does is they send you another card free of charge to wherever you are in the world and they do it very quickly ladies and gentlemen. So I'm just going to go over some key features. So the, the bank account is available in US sterling, sorry the bank account is available in sterling, US dollar, euro and Australian dollar. It has no maintenance fee whilst the minimum balance is maintained. The minimum balance is 2,500 euros. So what you would do is once you land your first job on a super yacht, you would approach your captain and ask him for all the necessary paperwork, which we will link below. Then you send it off to uh, Standard Bank and they will then process your account for you and send you your card to a pickup location that you guys determine. The minimum balance, as we said, is 2,500 euros. So you'll get your captain to transfer that amount into your bank account. And once it's in your bank account, you can start using the money and stop swiping your card wherever you are in the world. The nice thing is that um, the maintenance fee is not expensive. Um, the to swipe anywhere in the world is free. So overall, it's the perfect bank account for yachties. Um, just to go, so there we go. Yeah, that's and that's pretty much everything in a nutshell. Um, if you are in Antibes, there is uh, Blue Water does have a partnership with Standard Bank where you can actually go into the, the, the office and give in all your details and they'll process it for you, which is great. If you aren't in Antibes, then you can just send the application form and all the information to the email we'll provide in the video below. So all in all, an offshore bank account is essential. Another nice thing is that they let you open up a US dollar account and a euro account within, if within one bank account. So that's nice. If you're earning money in Europe, your euros can get transferred into your um, euros account. And if you're in America earning dollars, your dollars can get transferred into your dollar account. And that way you never ever lose the money. Then once the money's in your account and you want to send it home, all you do is you log online and you just send that money home and it'll be a lot cheaper, ladies and gentlemen, and way better. So, if you want any more information regarding the offshore bank account, um, we've included the PDF link below. Make sure you check that out. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this. Thank you so much for making it to this point of the course. And um, we'll see you in the next video. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. Congratulations on finishing this course and getting right to the end. We hope you have this burning excitement inside of you to join the industry, the same one we had all those years ago. It truly is a one-of-a-kind industry unlike any other with experiences few people in this world get to have. Your stories, your memories, and most importantly, your experiences and friends will stay with you for a lifetime. Nobody can ever take that away from you. In the beginning, the journey will not be easy. However, it all depends on the work you put in. And like with all things in life, if it is easy, it wouldn't be worth it. And trust us, ladies and gentlemen, it's most definitely worth it. You will not look back. So as we've said in the past, step out of your comfort zone 
A comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. We feel that you are more than prepared to be on your way to, to start an exciting new chapter in your life. We are more than confident that you'll have a successful career in the superyard industry and it will cherish you and with all with everything that you deserve. Remember, we are always just an email away. Please update us on your journey at all times. Please post in the Facebook group as often as you can. And when you finally land that first job, please make it known. We can't wait to see what boat you work on and where. Enjoy the ride. And we here at Super Yacht School want to wish you all the best. To smooth seas and happy sailing. Thank you so much, guys. Kind regards from Super Yacht School.